Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to call the uh, October 21st, 2021 regular meeting of the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission to order. Could we please have a roll call? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Greenberg? Here. Maxwell? Here. Nielsen? Commissioner Nielsen, I see you. You're muted. <laughs> Stay here, please. Sorry, here. Thank you. Spellman? He said he was here. <laughs> okay. And Chair Griffin. Here. Again, welcome. I uh, will now move on. There's nobody absent. Are there any statements of disqualification? None. We'll move to oral questions. This is the time when anyone can speak for up to three minutes on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, but is uh, legitimately before the commission. And I did hear from one person who wanted five minutes who said he was speaking for a group of his neighbors. And if he's on the, if he sees he wants five minutes, he will be, uh, I'll, I'll give him that extra time. So let me open up all communications and Hopefully, it will all go smoothly. And Chair, could you, uh, for the record, could you tell me who the individual is that you've allowed extra time for? Uh, his name is Alan Spell uh, Alan uh, Eagle. Okay, let me write that down real quick. Uh, let me see. Eagle. Okay. There are several people who wish to speak. Give me one second to. Hi there, uh, this is Rob Sonnenfeld. Um, I was just uh, uh, speaking. Um, I was hoping that the uh, Planning Commission could uh, consider taking up um, uh, uh, resolutions um, in support of the empty home tax um, and, uh, uh, and in opposition to the Greenway Initiative. Um, and I'm also asking for the commission to uh, uh, oppose the our future initiative. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the uh, the empty home tax is a, uh, a really good idea. Moves us in the right direction towards uh, uh, funding affordable housing for our community, um, and uh, and. Uh, reduce it, the ability of uh, speculators to sit on on um, homes that that are sitting vacant that no one can live in. Um, I think the uh, uh, the downtown our downtown our our future ballot initiative is misguided. Um, I I do agree generally that uh, that we shouldn't be trying to. Uh, uh, Increase the net amount of parking that we have downtown, um, but uh, the idea of basically handcuffing the city by changing our general plan um, to uh, to mandate the the uses of parking um, in 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 downtown lots, I think, is business guided. Um, and uh, uh, the Greenway Initiative, I, I think, uh, also sets us back um, for generations in terms of uh, uh, transit access. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next person. Okay, uh, Michael Posner, you have three minutes. Go ahead. You have to mute yourself. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Micah Posner, and um, I'm part of a group called Build Communities, Not Hotels. 
hopefully you're aware that the the city is considering selling two small parcels on Front Street to a hotel developer, a consortium, and it'd be run out of a be a boutique hotel run out of an outfit out of New York. Um, and I thought this was really outrageous because, I mean, for one thing, it goes around the spirit, if not the letter, of the Surplus Land Act. But then additionally, I, I felt like, well, you know, how could the city just sell properties to someone they like to for them to have a big capitalist project, you know? So I talked to a lawyer and we did a little research and I sent you this letter and it turns out that to preclude these just handing their friends properties, there is a law that says that the city has to fund the planning body, which I think of as you guys, has to decide that it's in congruence with the general plan. This is very apropos in this case because in this case, the city staff want the hotel, you know, to make money for the city, but that's not necessarily what's generally in the best interest of the community. And the general plan is our guiding document that says where we think about what's best for our community. Um, so the city has to do this anyways, but I'm asking you guys to officially put on the agenda a discussion about whether the city should be selling these parcels to a hotel developer instead of using them to encourage affordable housing, which is what, you know, the spirit of the surplus land act says. Um, and, you know, whether that really makes sense, whether that's in accordance with our general plan. And, and you know, there's been no open conversation about this at all. It's happened for years in closed session at city council level. And you guys representing the public and thinking about planning and shepherding the general plan would be the right body to bring the public in and have a conversation about whether this is really in the best interest of the community, not just, you know, the city as a business enterprise. So um, hopefully you will talk to staff and uh, get that on uh, your agenda once the staff has finished studying the issue and made their findings. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I see a hand by uh, Miranda Solik. Go ahead. Yes, Hi. 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 Um, I want to support what I said about the empty home tax. I've seen that it worked in Oakland, and I think that would give us a bunch of money to build more affordable housing. And on the affordable housing uh, theme, I support totally what Micah said. That surplus land policy is meant for the city to build more affordable housing. I can't believe in the first place that the credit union sold to a hotel. The city owns the two parcels next to them. That means that the city has an ability to say, no, we're not gonna be supporting rich hotels, which we have plenty of already here, at the expense of the possibility of building affordable housing. So I think you all understand what I mean. I, that policy, the surplus land policy was designed specifically to increase affordable housing. And we need that so much here. Please think about how to present this so that the city council actually can take some action on not selling those parcels to the hotel. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone else? Uh, I see a phone number. Um, 831-426-3857, if you would uh, unmute yourself and identify yourself, and you'll have up to three minutes. Are you there? You need to unmute yourself if you want to talk to us. Perhaps I should go to the next speaker. Why don't you go to the next? Oh, wait. Hello. Hello, who is this? Hello, my name is Alan Spidel. Oh, okay, Alan. Um, I did say that you were, uh, because you're representing your neighbors, to some extent at least, some of your neighbors, uh, I'll give you up to five minutes. Thank you very much. And I have supporting documents that I would hand out if we were in a meeting in person. I can provide these at your request. My concern tonight focuses on the direction that the planning department is taking the city and also whether or not they are fulfilling their obligations to you 
in the staff reports that they prepare for appeals hearings such as ours. A brief summary of our appeals hearing before you last December 3rd might remind you what I'm talking about. Uh, we uh, were before you talking about 418 Pennsylvania, the triplex behind an existing house, three stories tall with a flat roof, 100 feet long, substantial neighborhood opposition to this, and I hope you recall the hearing December 3rd. State law trumped neighborhood concerns then, and you voted 4 to 3 to approve this permit. Our appeal went on to the city council, and they approved it 5 to 2 on February 9th, and that could have been the end of the story. You may also recall that the best feature of this project was that the developer was going to make one of the three three-bedroom units deed restricted for affordable housing. The applicants went on to emphasize this before the city council. Indeed, it was the primary focus of their presentation. I do have transcripts of this presentation if you are interested in reading them. After the council approval, but before the permit was issued, the developers submitted a plan revision to the city about a month ago. It's currently under review by all the relevant departments. The proposed revision adds a fifth unit to the project which they want to call an ADU. The unit replaces one of the garages, which of course results in a loss of off-street parking. The revision takes away the three-bedroom affordable unit they promised and designates the new fifth unit, a much smaller one-bedroom unit, as the affordable unit. The planners that we've talked to have labeled this a ministerial review. Apparently that means a rubber stamp situation even though this is now a very different project. No public hearing and, crucially, no course of appeal should they sign off on this revision and issue the permit. Our first question to you is whether this is just. A very different project is emerging from the planning process, different from the one we all looked at last December. What was the point of that appeals hearing if the real project was hidden from us? My suggestion that the planning department staff knew about this different reality and withheld this information may strike some as a very serious charge. Be careful here. I have a letter from a senior planner that I think validates my claim. Briefly, her argument asserts that state law requires the replacement unit in this project to be comparable in size to the unit that is to be demolished to make room for the triplex. Here, let me remind you that there was no such unit on the setup that the commission was given. And now I quote her email, the designation of the affordable unit was a condition of the approval of the permit. The attention, intention, being that it would be met at the building permit stage in some manner. She is referring to condition number 27 on this permit, a condition that was added during the planning process, well before our hearing. In short, the planners anticipated, perhaps they knew, that a fifth unit would be added in the building permit stage of the process, in other words, at the very end, and that this would become the affordable unit. And they did not report this to you, the Planning Commission, nor did they report this to the Council. Maybe I'm mistaken here, like us, did you believe this to be a four-unit project with a three-bedroom affordable unit as part of the deal? It really troubles us to imagine them in our December Zoom meeting with you maintaining a silence about this important detail. Don't you commissioners and don't our elected representatives on the council deserve a more thorough report from the city staff? It's obligation here. Our second concern focuses on whether this, where this will lead if it's unchecked. In this same set of letters, which I can provide, the planner concedes that there is no state law that compels them to accept these specific plan revisions. This re revision is what's known as a VU conversion, and state law does speak about that, but only in reference to existing garages. That's the key word in the law. Existing garages can be converted to, into ADUs and ministerial actions. No hearing necessary, 
No notification needed. That's five minutes. The letter from the Allow me to finish, please. Yes, I'll try to wrap this up. The letter from the planner concedes this and explains why the department has developed a policy that extends these state protections to, our, to these virtual garages, and that's what's happening here. How many other projects will undergo this cynical 11th hour transformation? In summary, you and we saw a four unit project with a three bedroom affordable unit. This is what the city council saw and heard as well. And yet the reality all along no, was, not a, up, please. Oh, was not a four unit all project, all. but a five unit one. And the deed restriction affordable housing is not big enough for a couple, much less for a family with kids. So thank you for your time and I hope you can look into this for us. Thank you. Um, okay, I see um, Tom Nadi has his hand up, go ahead. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm intending um, to ask the same thing that uh, Mr. Posner asked for earlier, that you, uh, um, that you put on your agenda uh, a consideration of uh, this uh, sale of the small parking lots on either side of the uh, credit union site. Um, this luxury apartment is not, doesn't, it doesn't speak to affordable housing. I'm afraid that a lot of the community is gonna get the idea that this is just neighbors, you, you know, trying to protect themselves from uh, new housing. This isn't housing, this isn't, this isn't affordable, this isn't unaffordable housing. This is a luxury hotel downtown. Uh, the credit union has decided they're gonna go for it. I'm hoping the city will um, be more serious than the credit union was in allowing uh, the public to address this. And I'm hoping that can begin at least uh, at this organization planning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Ron Pomerantz. I see your hand up. And then Chris Crum. Uh, good evening. Thank you for your time. Uh, the city's excess surplus, I say that, it really doesn't have surplus land as I see it. Um, the property I'm speaking of is the one Posner and Tom Nadi have spoken to already. Um, and it should not be acted upon with haste or transparency. I too am asking the Planning Commission you, go, you all to uh, take on this issue to see if it fits in the general plan. Once city's property is sold, it is gone. It's gone forever. And a luxury hotel, I don't believe is in the community's best interest. Open space, park, truly affordable housing would certainly best fit uh, our future needs. So please, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm begging you to put this on your agenda um, to see what would happen with this surplus, supposedly surplus land. This is pretty valuable and I hate to see it disappear into a luxury hotel. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Crone, you're up next. Okay. Thank you all for your service. Can you hear me? Yes, but it would help if you spoke a little louder. Okay, I'm gonna speak louder. Uh, thank you all for your service in the Planning Commission. Of course, I would like to see that service come to fruition and I urge the planning, uh, come to fruition, uh, meaning the Planning Commission should meet more often uh, for the sanity of the community. Um, I wanna say, I wanna urge the Planning Commissioners to place the so-called remnant parcels uh, that the city is seeking to sell to an out-of-town hotel developer uh, to make the project work at the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. Uh, I urge you to place those on your next agenda for a discussion. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Carrillo, you're up next. That's, and that's the last hand I see. So if anybody else wants to speak, put your hand up. We'll let the clerk know. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to add, I'm, I'm also imploring you to, to consider the sale of those two lots for a, for a use that would benefit the 
And I wanted to just add the thought that um, I believe this luxury hotel is going to have something like 270 rooms. Times when I will be full, there'll be, you know, 260 cars driving into that intersection. And there'll be people here vacationing, being here for the beach and showering and using our water, two or three people possibly to a room, 260 rooms. It's just, there's nothing about this project that is of use to our community can see is detriment. So I'm I'm imploring you to please put this on your agenda and give it careful consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak during oral communication? Um, clerk, do you, I see you, is there anybody? Okay, then I'm gonna close the, uh, the oral communication section. Let me, um, we cannot, Consider items that are raised during oral communications at our meeting because they weren't noticed, uh, which they need to be under the Brown Act. So I think uh, if, it, if, if the commission will uh, support this, I would like to ask staff to provide a report on our next meeting on this. What's the status with the proposed hotel downtown? And what's going on with the 418 Pennsylvania uh, Pennsylvania project? I think the concerns that were raised um, should be responded to, um, and I it might be helpful to have a response in writing um, for the commission to see it and for, for the public to comment on. So, is there any objection to from staff from providing some report at our next meeting on those? Two proposals, or at least two, one project and one proposal. Samantha. Yeah. Um, good evening. No, with that, that would be fine. We can we can do that. Okay. Thank you. And then, in terms of the initiative uh, request, any commissioner can um, ask that the commission take a position on uh, an initiative. Whether you know that's a good idea or not, the commission can discuss it, and sometimes. The desire is to sort of let the public decide, but it's not unusual for public bodies to take positions on uh, um, these matters. So if there are commissioners that want to bring any of those three um, initiatives to the commission for um, a recommendation or their, you know, the commission has no role in the process, um, the initiative process, that would be uh, up to them. Is there any other uh, anything to say about uh, what we've heard from oral communication? Okay, then let's move on. Yes, Commissioner Greenberg. Yes, yeah, so I think it's a good idea for us as a body to discuss the empty home tax, which two people brought up. Um, and is that something that I can propose for the next meeting? that we discuss whether or not we want to take a position on that and get to share information about that? As I understand it, and my guess is that staff will correct me if I'm wrong, um, you could put a letter on with the empty home tax and a recommendation for what you uh, would recommend the commission would do. And then the commission can discuss it and decide whether it wants to take any position at all or if it, and if it wants to take a position what position it wants to take. Um, as far as I understand it, that is, in a, you know, it's related to um, planning in the city, and so I don't see any um, reason why a commissioner can't put a letter on and say, here's a proposal, I think the commission should support it or whatever. Um, is there any, does the staff have any problem with that? I would say, Submit a you know a letter with uh, the initiative. Uh, I don't know who to ask from Seth. Marla. Yeah, I I don't I don't believe that there's any any problem with taking a position on initiative. Um, we'll certainly check it, double check it with the city attorney on it. But um, you know I, I'm immediately aware of any issue with that. 
So if you would like the, co the commission to discuss it, uh, you can just put it on, you know, put a letter on with the uh, initiative. Okay. Anybody, anybody else? So let's move on to public hearings. Item number one is 130 Center Street. Uh, and this is what I want to propose for a process here that we get and allow commissioners to ask questions on the staff report that we then hear from the applicant and then the commissioners can ask questions of the applicant and then we hear from the public uh, and then after we hear from the public, we close the public hearing. And of course, if commissioners have questions for members of the public, they can raise them. Uh, if not, the public hearing will be closed and it will become the, uh, the, the application will be back before the commission for consideration and action. Does that make sense? So why don't we start out with a staff report. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, this is Ryan Bain, senior planner. I'm going to try and do my best to share my screen here without screwing this up. Uh, let's see here. Do you see that? Do you see the PowerPoint? No. Nope. Sorry. Right. Okay. Let me try this again. Okay. I'll go ahead and share this. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. Okay. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. So, good evening, um, Ryan Bain, uh, Senior Planner. Uh, what we have before you tonight is uh, the 130 project at 130 Center Street. <clears throat> and excuse me if I, after two years of not getting sick, of course I get sick, you know, yesterday. So, if I get any coughing or wheezing, I'm sorry about that. Um, so the project, let's see, we'll start out here. Um, the, the, it's approximately a 1.19 acre uh, project site uh, located on the eastern side of, of Center Street, just north of the intersection of Center and Front Street. And it, there's commercial and residential uh, uses that are surrounding the project site and it's founded by an auto body shop um, to the north, hotel use to the south, uh, and multifamily um, to the east, and then some commercial and depot park across Center Street uh, to the west. Um, as you can see, there's no, no trees located on the site. There, we did give this tree survey because there are some trees that are abutting neighboring properties, um, but it's mostly a paved site with uh, two existing structures. So the project involves a proposal to construct a six-story uh, mixed-use project consisting of one level of underground parking, uh, ground-level commercial space, and 230 uh, single-room occupancy units. Uh, the, the subject parcel has a regional visitor commercial uh, general plan designation, and this, is, this designation applies to areas that emphasize a variety of commercial uses that serve Santa Cruz residents as well as visitors. Uh, mixed development is strongly encouraged in the RVC district. So specifically, the general plan RVC designation calls out the south of Laurel um, as intended for mixed use and residential development, along with visitor serving and neighborhood commercial uses to connect the beach area with downtown Santa Cruz. Um, the general plan allows a floor ratio of range of 0.25 to 3.5 for parcels which are located in the RVC uh, and are included in the area plan. And the proposed project is 2.94 uh, FAR falling within that range. So there's a numerous general plan policies that the project is meeting. Um, just to go over a couple, uh, in neighborhoods near visitor areas, give priority uses that serve both visitors and residents. So uh, the mixed use has both residential and available to visitors and residents, encourage higher intensity residential uses and maximum densities in accordance with general plan land use designations, allow and encourage development that meets the high end of the general plan uh, land use designation uh, and less constraints uh, associated with the, with the site, 
allow the following residential uses to exceed the maximum densities in the chapter, so using density bonus, which um, we'll get into a density bonus as part of this project. In terms of economic development policies, um, it encourages the development of year-round business and visitor activities um, and attracts and engages local residents, um, provides for residents daily shopping needs and local serving neighborhood commercials with the uh, commercial spaces that are part of the mixed-use project. Encourage neighborhood shopping and nodes of commercial development that serve residential areas and have adequate transit, pedestrian, and bicycle access. So this is very centrally located with transit and pedestrian and bicycle um, access all around the site. Um, support the development of neighborhood gathering places in conjunction with local serving neighborhood commercials. So again, um, it's meeting a lot of these economic development policies laid out in the general plan. Um, the, the project is also located within the Beach and South of Laurel Comprehensive Area Plan. Um, so it basically, um, let's see here. And that plan was adopted in, in 1998 by the city council and it's located in the south of Laurel sub area of that plan. Um, and it's strategically located between the downtown and the beach area. So it, it's street system for the south of Laurel area, which includes Pacific, um, Front and Center Street, which this project is, is located, really links these two areas and as, as a physical link between these two areas, the foundation of the South of Laurel is seen as a strategic uh, economic and transportation component of a comprehensive strategy. So um, there's numerous uh, Beach and South of Laurel plan policies that the project is meeting, just going over a couple of them that protect and enhance the charming small scale residential neighborhood in South of Laurel while encouraging the significant development opportunities presented by vacant and underutilized parcels. So this is a, a it, while it's not vacant, it's certainly an underutilized uh, parcel. Uh, encourage mixed use development in the residential sections of the South of Lower area on major arterials, Center Street being one of them. Um, Multi-level large scale development to optimize use of opportunity sites. Um, locating parking lots to the rear of structures and wherever possible underground or within structures. Um, so. The project uh, does have underground parking that's located uh, not, in, not in view. Uh, balconies, terraces, courtyards, and similar outdoor spaces to take advantage of views and create street vitality and encourage mixed-use development in the residential sections of the area on major arterials by overlaying the mixed-use zoning district on appropriate areas and encouraging a mixture of market rate and affordable housing, which this project offers. Um, the project is located in the RTC, uh, Tourist Residential Beach District, the zoning district. Um, so the purpose of this district is to establish standards for development of residential uses uh, mixed with neighborhood commercial, motel, and regional tourist commercial. These standards are designated both to improve uses and encourage new developments in a manner that maintains a harmonious balance between residential and regional commercial uses. Um, also in the RTC, the the two uses that are being proposed, the mixed use residential, which does have some ground floor um, residential, is it basically states that the project would be subject to the RTA district regulations. Um, and then also sing, it's a, a single room occupancy SRO project, 15 units or more. And so both of these um, for the RTC district require uh, a special use permit and design permit, which is also part of this uh, proposal. So for the RTA development standards, um, there is a maximum building height of 36 feet. Um, however, California density law and the city's corresponding density bonus ordinance provide tools to incentivize affordable housing and or deeper levels of affordability. Um, and one incentive is that applicants can utilize a waiver or modification to the development standards that would physically preclude construction of the density bonus project. So. For the subject project, the applicants are proposing a waiver to the district height standard to allow additional stories um, with the highest point of the building proposed at 75 feet. In addition to the height waiver, the applicants are also requesting a uh, reduction to the required setbacks. So with the exception of the height and setback um, standards, uh, all the RTA zone district requirements are being met. So as I mentioned, these are the permits that are part of this uh, package as part of this proposal, uh, a authorization permit, a design permit, 
a coastal permit, a special use permit, and then a density bonus request. So for the non-residential demolition, um, so there are two commercial buildings on the site that are proposed for demolition. Um, the primary structure is a, a single story commercial building that was constructed in 1963. The other is the Hertz rental car structure that was constructed as a detached showroom. So um, pursuant to the non-residential demolition authorization permit ordinance, uh, really the, the, the purpose of it is to evaluate requests for demolition of structures over 50 years old and, and to determine whether they have any historic value um, before they're demolished. So a historic evaluation um, was prepared as part of the application, submitted as part of the application, which included um, or concluded that the property did and does not appear eligible for listing on the city historic building survey. So this is a uh, take a look at, as I mentioned, also a design permit is required. This is kind of the, the site plan here. So it's kind of an unconventional shaped lot. It's generally flat with approximately 100 and 82 feet of frontage along Center Street. Um, it's not located with any mapped potentially sensitive habitat or resource area. So the, the proposed mixed-use project consists of six stories above one level of underground parking um, with a footprint that covers the majority of the site. Uh, its site plan includes a U-shaped building with access to the project site provided from a a new driveway from Center Street near the northern property line, which is right here. Um, the driveway provides access to both grade level parking as well as an underground level. This is taking a look at, um, this is the north elevation from Center Street. And then um, here's a look at Center Street with it. So it has a combination of 13 feet of sidewalk uh, as part of the right of way. Uh, in addition to a 15-foot setback. So the building is proposed to be a setback approximately 28 feet from the back of curb um, to provide a pretty good expanse of sidewalk uh, that will kind of have a public plaza feel. Um, and actually looking at this, I think it actually is going to have a deeper feel to it. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a, it's going to be set back quite a bit from the, the roadway. Um, here is a site section um, shows the proposed building. Um, this is Center Street and then across the street as well as behind. And then also looking at from Center Street, looking at the hotel and the body shop to the north. So um, just kind of just go just quickly through some of the, the floor plan, the ground parking, um, which has uh, both and also has storage lockers for all of the residents. Um, as well as parking at the ground level. Um, the first two floor frontage consists of, of uh, two commercial spaces that total 2,356 square feet of retail or restaurant space, in addition to a lobby um, and leasing area um, for the residential use. There's also a bike cafe. Um, the, bike cafe the bike cafe basically is a area to, for residents or visitors of residents or anyone coming to a, a retail or commercial uses where they can basically safely store their, their bikes. So um, that's basically the, the, the thought behind the bike cafe. Um, and let's see what else. Yeah, so there's also, as I mentioned, there's also residential uses as well as storage on this level as well. And, and shared community open space as well. So. The residential uses will be located primarily on levels two through six. Um, the second floor that's shown here also includes residential amenities such as a game room, um, a fitness center, and a large podium level open space with seating and landscaping. And all of these amenities will be available to all, all of the residents. And as I mentioned, the rest of these levels are mainly all residential units. Um, on the sixth level, though, there is a there is a community room and a larger outdoor recreation deck that's facing Center Street. Um, and just to give you an idea of the so the proposed 233 SRO units are broken down into three configurations. Um, there's 78 micro units, which is averaging 295 square feet. There's 65 standard, um, which averages 320 square feet, 
and the extended units are averaging 400 uh, square feet. Um, so the beach and south of Laurel plan design guidelines were also adopted in 1998 um, and as an appendix to the beach and south of Laurel area plan and part of the city's certified local coastal program. So the guidelines are provided for the south of Laurel, Laurel area in which the proposed project is located, which recommends the use of uh, either Victorian, Spanish colonial revival, or other traditional architectural themes. So the new residential development is basically the whole point of the design guidance is for new residential development to exhibit the high quality design and detail of traditional architecture in the community. So the proposed building, as you can see, has been designed in a Spanish colonial revival style. It's consistent with all of the Beach and South of Laurel plan design guidelines, uh, it incorporates stucco walls, courtyards, arches, towers, balconies, uh, decorative iron and de tile details, tile roofs, and other features typical of the Spanish colonial box. Um, this is a single room occupancy or SRO project, and so there is a specific uh, chapter of our zoning code that regulates uh, single uh, SROs. And here's, it, the project is meeting all these requirements. There actually are limitations on the size of uh, or the, the average size, uh, all of this, all the units can't exceed an average size greater than 300 feet. Um, they all have kitchen and bathrooms, closets. Um, they, they're certainly exceeding the common usable open space by quite a bit. Um, 2,330 is what's required. They're providing almost 20,000. Um, laundry facilities. Um, storage units, as I mentioned in the basement, there's storage units, um, bike parking, and then also they provided a management plan. So they're meeting all the requirements of the SRO ordinance. In terms of parking, um, so there's a parking garage with two levels, one at grade, one underground, will be located on site. It provides, they're providing 209 off-street parking spaces. Um, so the, par the parking requirements for SOs, SROs is one space for each dwelling unit and that the commercial spaces are calculated at the higher restaurant uh, requirement, uh, a total of 20, park, 20 parking spaces would be required um, for the commercial. So um, 253 spaces would be required under our standard ordinance. But um, as I mentioned, this is a, there's a density bonus um, that's being requested as part of this application. And the density bonus ordinance does allow for reductions in park housing developments with at least 11% very low income or 20% lower income units are within one half mile of a major transit stop, which this is, and have un unobstructed access to that stop, um, the residential, par residential parking requirement can be reduced to 0.5 spaces for bedroom. So um, with that being said, um, 137 spaces would be required for this project, um, and they're providing 200, so that's a 72 based surplus uh, based on the density bonus parking requirements. Um, the, pro the proposed project um, is currently, as I mentioned, there's no trees on the site. It's pretty much paved. So the project is proposing uh, 61 new trees total as part of the project, as well as other new landscape plans proposed throughout the project will be, will be coastal native and um, focus on minimizing water use. Um, the proposed project requires a coastal permit because it is located within the coastal zone. Um, it's not in the appealable zone, it's just in the CZO district. Um, the project is consistent with the Beach and South of Laurel area LCP policies. Uh, it will not affect coastal views. It's not located in any sensitive uh, natural habitat or resource areas as mapped in the general plan and local coastal program. And the project includes floor, includes floor commercial space providing food and retail uses for visitors. Um, for visitor serving uses um, and the new, new residences of the development as well as existing residents in the South Laura area will be able to use um, those commercial areas as well. And so the project is consistent with the applicable policies of the local coastal program. As I mentioned, um, both the SRO use as well as the mixed use um, with non-commercial uses on the first floor require a special use permit. So um, that is also part of this project. So the purpose of the con or consideration of a special use, use permit is to ensure 
the proper integration of essential or desirable uses in certain locations or zoning districts. So the project is consistent with the general plan and Beach and South Aurora plan and that it's providing important affordable rental housing, visitor serving, and neighborhood commercial, and it maximizes the development potential of an underutilized site. Also, all the utility installations, such as trash enclosures, storage units, and parking are all designed into the building, making them accessible, but screened from view. Um, getting to density bonus. So, um, becoming more popular, and this was, but it's been around for a long time. So, um, to address California's needs for affordable housing, um, the state enacted the density bonus law in 1979 to encourage provision of affordable housing by offering a combination of benefits to developers. So for projects that include the requisite number of affordable housing units and upon the request of an applicant, cities are required um, to, one, allow more rate market rate units to be built than otherwise allowed by the applicable zoning designation, and also to provide incentive sessions, such as reduced development standards um, that result in actual and identical cost savings, or also provide waivers. Um, or modifications that would physically preclude the project from being constructed, as well as allowing reduced parking. So cities have very limited discretion um, when reviewing density bonus applications and are, are generally obligated to grant city bonus and incentives, concessions, or waivers um, uh, to the developer. So to determine whether a project qualifies for a density bonus, the percentage of affordable units is based on the maximum number of units that would be permitted under the city's zoning code, so a base density. So in areas where there is no density range, which this happens to be that case, the zoning ordinance requires an applicant to submit base plans um, or plans that show a project that fully conforms to the objective standards in order to determine the number of units that could be constructed on the site thus establishing the base density. So basically meaning setbacks, heights, um, all of the RTA, in this case, uh, development standards. So the applicant has provided those uh, base plans that meet all of those RTA standards. And we determined that the base density is 155 units. So, uh, so market rate projects providing certain percentages of affordable units um, or units at deeper levels of affordability are entitled to an increase in a density up to 50% of the total number of units that are allowed under the city's zoning ordinance, in this case, 155. So help offset the increased costs associated with the increased number of uh, or more deeply affordable units. So by law, uh, the percentages of affordable units that qualify a project for the density bonus are based on the base project only and not the base project plus the density bonus units. So pursuant to our city, our city inclusionary ordinance, developments um, in a residential development comprised of SR units, 20% of the single room occupancy unit shall be made available for rent to very low income households at an affordable rent. So with a base density of 155 units, 20% uh, is 31 very low income units that will be provided as part of this project. Um, and according to AB 2345, um, if 15% of the total conforming base density is designated to be very low, which that's the case here, it's 20%, development projects then qualify for a 50% density bonus uh, or for this particular project up to 233 uh, total units. Uh, as I mentioned, um, there are two waivers being requested. Um, for density bonus law, an applicant actually request as many waivers as they want. There's no limitation like there is with concessions. Um, in this particular case, they're requesting two waivers, one to exceed maximum height, which I kind of touched on previously, as well as a reduction in setbacks. Uh, it, uh, our, our city's community outreach policy for planning projects, applicants did have an online webinar for the community to learn about the project, ask questions, and give input. Um, that webinar was held on August 4th of this year. There were approximately 25 members of the public that attended the meeting um, with questions and discussion items, traffic, uh, parking, water consumption, and property management, and, and leasing restrictions regarding the number of tenants per unit, as well as some questions about whether vacation rentals would be permitted. So um, while the previously mentioned users were part of the discussion, overall the responses to the project were supportive. Um, specifically in regards to the design, 
addition of high density housing in the south of Laurel Corridor, which many felt was, was needed, and the provision of very little units. So, uh, in addition to the webinar, um, as with most of our projects, we have a, a project webpage that was created and have any, any members of the uh, community are, have access to the information on the project. Um, the California Environmental Quality Act provides several categorical exemptions which are applicable to categories of projects and activities that the lead agency has determined generally do not pose a risk of impacts on the environment. Um, the project consists of 233 SROs and ground floor commercial uh, and it's within a developed uh, urban area of the city and is basically an infill site. So the project has been determined to be exempt from CEQA under a categorical exemption uh, for the infill development exemption. So in closing, the development um, will implement the city's vision for the South of Laurel area uh, as expressed by the general plan and the beach and South of Laurel plan uh, by providing much needed, deeply affordable and market rate residential units and providing a connection between the downtown and the beach area. Um, the project has been thoughtfully designed to be attractive to both permanent residents and tourists with emphasis placed on compatibility of design, landscaping, and site planning in compliance with the design guidelines of the beach and south of Laurel area. Uh, additionally, with a request for a density bonus, the project will maximize density while providing 20% of the units at very low income, which will be a significant addition um, to the city's affordable housing stock. So um, as conditioned, the, the proposed project meets the requirements of the zoning ordinance and provides a development that is compatible with the surrounding area in terms of scale and design. Therefore, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and recommend approval of the coastal permit, design permit, density bonus request um, to exceed height and, and setbacks, encroachment, uh, sorry, that, and uh, exceed height and reduce setbacks of the proposed project based on the findings and conditions of approval provided uh, in the staff report. Uh, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do commissioners have uh, questions of staff? Well, I have a few questions. Um, could you say something about the distribution of the affordable units in the project? Um, how are they distributed to the various uh, SRO units? Um, I don't think that we've gotten that far with the applicant in terms of labeling specific units. Um, the applicant might be able to speak to that better than I can. I know they do want to speak and give a presentation, but um, in talking with, I want to say that um, I don't know if they're going to label specific units as it, it may move around depending upon. That, that wasn't my, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear okay. about my question. I, it wasn't whether there are specific units, but since there are three uh, size units, mini, standard, and oh, sorry. Standard, uh, will the 20% yeah. be distributed at the same percentages as those three categories? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm thinking the applicant probably could respond to that. I don't think okay, there's anything I'm just that where the ordinance that, yeah, with that. particular ones, yeah. Commissioner Spellman, did you have something to add here? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Sorry, I didn't get my hand up quick enough. Well, okay, well, go ahead. Um, so one question I have is regarding the inclusionary numbers, and maybe you can clarify this on the state density law, right? So SROs are required who have the very low in designation um, as a starting point, right? So we don't have a lower level of affordability as an option, right? We're already at the lowest level. So how do we reconcile um, that they're offering, you know, additional inclusionary incentives if they're already obligated at the lowest level? I don't know if I'm understanding your question. So they're meeting the 20% of very low, and then you're asking if there's... It could be a misunderstanding. So what I'm asking is typically um, projects are offering 
additional affordability than what's required by the zoning in order to get qualified or, or additional uh, incentives under the state density law or the bonus law, sorry. Am I misunderstanding yeah, that? Well, I, I think, and I, don't, I might have touched on it, is that, I mean, it, so state density bonus, I'm definitely not the expert at, but um, my understanding is that in order to get certain incentives um, and waivers, et cetera, uh, and to get the 50% density bonus, you have to meet certain um, percentage of low, you know, income, certain levels of affordability. In this particular case, um, they're well exceeding that already, just exclusionary requirements. So I think I think it was 15%. That's very low. If you provide that, you, you're automatically, based on density bonus law, uh, from, uh, guaranteed to do a 50% density bonus. And so with the 20% very low required by our city ordinance, they're already exceeding that and so automatically qualify for that 50% density bonus. I don't know if that Let's see if I can clarify what uh, I, my understanding of the question. It is whether SROs the SRO ordinance requires a level of affordability uh, mm -hmm. for all the units. Is that what well, you No, I mean, the code is clear. The code says that they have to be very low income units, right? That's, that's not a, a negotiation. That's, that's right. required for every SRO project. Correct. And so I, we've reviewed a few projects over the past couple of years that um, didn't need to have the very low designation. And I understood that they chose to make some of those very low in order to get, you know, the, the bonus, right? So uh, that's, that's my only, already at that level. How do they get something if they're already required to, to do that? That's my point. Yeah, they and automatically like, get it. Yeah, I think I think basically with density bonus law, I think there's different variations, certain certain percentages of different levels of affordability to qualify for 50% or 35% or you know various differentiations of uh, the density bonus and, and increase. So with this SRO and with our specific uh, density bonus requirement, 20% very low. I mean, they basically qualify for most anything with in terms of the density bonus. Uh, it's already going above and beyond is my understanding. Okay. Right, uh, yeah, I can add on to that too. That, that's correct. He, um, the 20% very low qualifies them for the density bonus as well. They can count those units towards the density bonus. Okay. Um, Miriam? Yeah, so I just wanted to pick up on Commissioner Solomon. So is it the case then that the other 80% are low income? If in fact, as Commissioner Spellman is saying, all SROs have to be low income, is that what? No, no. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Oh, I thought you were right. saying every unit in an SRO project had to be. All the inclusionary units. The rest Sorry. of the market. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, that was my understanding as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I still have a couple more questions. Uh, could you close your stop sharing your screen, please, uh, Ryan? Oh, yeah. Another question is um, some of the correspondence that came in was questioning uh, the qualification for the parking reduction, right? Um, and I guess the criteria goes to the um, being close to the bus stop and people were questioning whether that um, interpretation of the bus meets the, the standard um, in order to qualify for the, you know, parking reduction from one to half per unit. Could you right. clarify that point, please? We actually have Claire Gallagher here. Um, he's, uh, she could probably answer that much more eloquently than I can. So I'll, I'll just give it over to her. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, Claire Gallagher, Transportation Center for the City. And in the simplest terms, state law defines what a high quality transit stop is. And when you use the density bonus, that gets amended to also include uh, stops that are included within a regional trans or a, uh, MTP SCS, Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy. 
In our region, that plan is the AMBAG MTP SCS. Pacific Station is clearly mapped in that document. We have mapped all of those stops on our city GIS system available on both the public facing side and the internal side there. And this project location is definitively within the distance required by that section of state law. Okay, thank you for qualifying that. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then an interesting article came through in the correspondence from the public as well. Uh, one in particular was a, a letter from a lawyer representing local labor or laborers union, essentially. Um, and their claim was that, from what I understood anyway, so the construction of this project, not that this particular site had air quality issues, but the construction of the project itself would essentially create an issue that would um, be problematic, let's call it, in order to summarize. Has, have, has staff looked at that? Has, has anybody on the legal side looked at that letter? Is it? We did, yes. Uh, we actually forwarded it to our city attorney's office um, to have them take a, take a quick look at it. We just did it again this afternoon. Um, and kind of as I suspected, um, I mean, FECO really focuses its analysis of the project impacts on the natural environment, um, not so much the project's environment or impacts on future residents within the structure. Um, that's really more regulatory scope, which I'm sure you're familiar with, with in terms of Cal OSHA and healthy and safety standards. So um, it really is not applicable in this particular case in terms of uh, when it comes to FECO. Okay, thanks for that. And the last point is a clarification on the traffic study. Uh, there were several comments and correspondence relating to whether the times that the studies were done were appropriate, basically a week weekday study, weekend study. None of the weekend traffic numbers were included in that. Could you speak to the, that issue, please? I might call Claire back for that. She, she's probably a good one, good one to answer that. Yes, happy to. Um, so I needed some clarification on what that question was exactly because under the California Environmental Quality Act, we no longer evaluate projects on the number of trips that are generated or level of service. We use vehicle miles traveled for that metric. And this project, um, as you can see in the um, Traffic study that was submitted is clearly below the DMT threshold of significance that were defined. Uh, if you do want to get into uh, counts that are done on only weekdays versus weekends, we also do have um, study guidelines that we use with um, projects that are coming in. Those are have weekday counts. They could also have weekend counts at the discretion of the city engineer or the transportation manager. We did not ask for those at this location. And the primary reason is because, and it's one of the exact reasons that SB 743, which changed our level of analysis from level of service to vehicle miles traveled was implemented is project location that is an infill location that is located in an area that has traffic. The traffic there is not from this project. Traffic there um, existed before this project, will exist after this project. And on the weekends, those conditions exist not because of this project. So doing counts during the weekend wouldn't actually change the level of analysis that much that we would see. And the reason that we do these counts now is because we use our TIFF calculations for how much we're asking for fee-based programs associated, not for any level of environmental review. So the only things that we use those counts for are fee-based programs. So two separate things. One, is there an environmental impact related to transportation? No, the vehicle miles traveled is much below our threshold of significance. Were the counts done on the weekday? Yes, and that was just for the fee-based calculation. Happy to clarify any of those points there because it, it, we've been going through a change with this in the last couple of years. Sure, no, that's helpful. Thank you very much. That's all I had. Other commissioners? I may follow up on some of the questions that were raised, but I did have two um other affordable housing one um the, you had a slide that talked about the dente bonus affordability requirement and it said it was based on a uh, funding source uh, and i didn't understand what that was all about 
that <clears throat> that might have been a typo actually. So my apologies for that. Okay. And then I just want to clarify in the NDU staff report and in the staff report it said, itself, um, it says that 20% um, of the projects is affordable. And that really is not the case. It's 20% of the base density that's affordable. Actually, it's 13% of the project, total project units are affordable. I think it's important to uh, make that distinction clear. Uh, the state law and the, the inability to, to uh, calculate density bonus units and figuring the uh, inclusionary requirements make that necessary, but it has a profound effect on the project, reducing the overall number of affordable units. So um, I hope that that can be, you know, made clear in future staff reports that there is that distinction between um, the base density requirements and the total percentage. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, and I, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. Yeah. Uh, Samantha. Um, I just wanted to answer one of your, I think it was the first question you asked, um, of what types of units are going to be the affordable units. And we do have a standard for inclusionary units in section 2416.025 that um, the inclusionary units need to um, be representative of the market rate unit mix. So um, that will be a requirement for affordable housing agreement. That's what I thought, but I, it wasn't in the staff report, so I wanted to clarify it to, um, uh, so that everybody understood that they, you know, all the affordable units wouldn't be just in the smallest units. So they have to be distributed just like the market rate units are distributed. That's right. Um, That's Mr. Mark, uh, Eric, did you want to say something? Oh, I was also going to add that, that that same section of the inclusionary ordinance also um, allows for inclusionary units to be um, slightly smaller uh, than the market rate units. They can actually be um, as uh, they can be, they just need to be at least 75% of the average size of the market rate units. So I know these are all pretty much studios, but they do range in size and, and that's um, requirements that's in the code. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the commissioners have any more questions of staff before we hear from the applicant? Seeing none, could uh, I assume that the applicant's representative is here, and now is your uh, chance to um, make a presentation. And I'll just mention that uh, I have their presentation. So if uh, if it's Jesse or the or the project architect that's going to give the presentation, but if you just want to cue me, I can cue it up for whoever wants to. Sure. Uh, so I yeah. see that Jesse Bristow's hand is up, so I'm going to call on him first. Yes. I, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I was just responding to Ryan, uh, Jesse Bristow with Clinton Miller. I'll be presenting. And yes, Ryan, if you want to run through uh, the presentation, and I'll just say next slide, that sounds great. Okay. Sounds good. Let me just bring this up. And then additionally, we will have our architect on. Um, I believe he called in uh, to speak, and perhaps he can, I, I think it's dial in to raise his hand, but perhaps if we need to call on the plan, um, he could then do that and then access them. I'm not sure how the process works to unmute him. Can you please just want to clarify, name? can you guys? I'm sorry, this uh, is David. clear. David, David Mead. Okay, he's, he's going I to- I saw his name speak. out there. Yes, he's our, he's our architect. I just want to clarify, is the uh, presentation up? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, great. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, Planning Commission, uh, Commissioner uh, Chair Schifrin, Commissioner Maxwell, Greenberg, Nielsen, Conway, Selman, and Dawson. So thank you very much for your time and your public service. Ryan's presentation was very thorough. Uh, there's just a few things, and I do feel redundant, um, but there's just a few things that I'd like to focus on, hopefully answer uh, some questions or provide clarification uh, for, for the project. Um, so you can go to the next slide. 
So this is our project. It is uh, 130 Center Street, also known as, as Calypso. Um, we've, uh, Ryan already kind of actual details and everything, but what I'd really like to highlight is, as, as this group knows, that you know, there, there are some complexities to the density bonus. So I'd just like to go over that and then, and then the elements that we're offering as part of this project. So next slide, please. So, um, yes, to clarify, the uh, city of Santa Cruz, back in 2019, the council elected to go from a 15% inclusionary requirement to a 20% inclusionary requirement for all new development. And more specifically, for the single room occupancy ordinance, um, there was language put in there that all units of the 20% are very low income. And so, uh, with that language, we cannot offer a blend. Uh, we have to provide uh, those units to be very low income um, as to what Commissioner Spellman was speaking to. So, um, you know, in, in other projects, there's probably, you know, maybe a 10% low income and then a 5% moderate income. And then the providing scale for that project would have gotten a 35% density bonus, for, for example. But because um, the city of Santa Cruz already requires very low income, as Brian mentioned, we, by default, it applying to the state density bonus, uh, the 50% increase um, kicks in. So we had a conforming model uh, on the 30 to 36-foot height and the um, objective setback. And so with that design, we came up with 155 SRO units. So based on this 20% allocation, we have 31 units. And again, the California state density bonus already kicks in because that requirement, the city's requirement, is, is more than what the state requires. So that 50% bump comes in. So 50% of the 155 is 77.5. And usually when it comes to inclusionary um, and just normal practices, uh, we round up. And so that'd be 78 units. And this project is 233 units with uh, 31 units uh, allocated to very low income. And so I'd, I'd like to highlight these uh, 2020 numbers. Um, this is the most recent information I could, could find and maybe it's changed, but over six years, um, the five to six year cycle for the RENA cycle, the city was able to build 57 units at very low. Uh, the remaining quota is 123 units for very low income. So we are providing, um, uh, you know, 31 for just this one project. And additionally, I would like to note the next cycle, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, uh, 2023 to 2031, the arena quota, the S is um, just for the very low income units, not low income or moderate, just very low. The estimated need allocated is 800 units just for the city of Santa Cruz. So that hasn't been, um, completely firmed up, but I just want to highlight that, you know, when these RENA numbers come out, this, this is an obligation for the city and the region to try to accommodate these numbers, and it's a huge number compared to what we've seen in past as a community. So, you know, we're hopeful that this project will, um, will help uh, start to meet some of these quota numbers, and, and then in the future as well. Uh, next slide, please. So again, a lot of questions in, in community meetings and engagement, and as you guys discussed, I just want to our unit. So we have a micro, a standard, and extended, and the trick, you know, they're pretty much studios. Um, SROs does allow flexibility with kitchens and whatnot, but um, as, as our project is proposed, um, we have 78 micros, they're 295 square feet. We have standard, which are uh, 328 square feet, and then we have 90 extended units at 400 square feet. And as Ryan mentioned, uh, we are beholden to um, the 345 average foot. Uh, we did receive comments from public like, hey, why aren't you building larger units? Why aren't you building, you know, three-bedroom apartments for families? And we do recognize that we have a major need for housing, of, you know, and housing people uh, from all walks of life and all types of units. Uh, our hope is that this project uh, will be able to provide housing for, you know, single, uh, young adults, uh, you know, young professionals, couples, 
and maybe couples that are downsizing from their home that want to be uh, closer to community services that are in the downtown or the London Nelson uh, Community Center, you know, amenities like that. Uh, in addition to, you know, this could serve as um, uh, housing for students as well. Uh, we do know that UCSD is, is struggling to house their students, so this could help in, in some regard. Uh, additionally, it is required that there's a 24-hour on-site management as required by code, and we haven't provided that. You go to the next slide, please. So the BMR allocation, um, to speak a little bit to what Samantha discussed. So yes, um, the, the materials need to be in kind at the market rate. We completely understand that. And, um, you know, as a builder, it doesn't make sense for us to, um, you know, pr provide a, a lower standard of living. That doesn't make sense. You order and build um, in kind, and, and that's what we do. Uh, additionally, we, we would not, um, we would not minimize those units that are that are affordable. Uh, that wouldn't make sense from a building standpoint. Building efficiency, as you saw, it's a very uh, well laid out floor plan where, where those units stack appropriately. Minimizing that that 75% would not make sense, nor would we want to do that. Um, but the allocation for that breakout of the 20% is based upon the 155 unit model, and so. On that model, we had 73 units total for the micro, so that's 14 BMR, and then we had a 28 units for the standard, so that's 6%, sorry, 6 units BMR, and then on the extended, we had 54 units, uh, so that's 11, totaling uh, 31 units, and that's how that would be allocated in the um, six-story model. So you would take those units and sprinkle them in the building, and that's how um, that's my understanding in, in uh, speaking with the uh, department and division. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a typical floor plan. I, I know Ryan, Ryan's presentation was planned, so it's hard to fit in um, on, a, on a PowerPoint. So pretty standard. Um, this is a medium-sized deck. So one component that we really try to add to the project, we do understand SROs are more of an efficiency unit. And as you saw, we provided a lot of amenities on site. In addition to that, um, the balconies are not counted against the, the square footage. So we feel we have a combination of this, this size uh, deck or balcony, and then we have Juliet balconies, and we do have a little bit larger size balconies. But again, you know, just kind of provides that personal open space in, in a smaller unit. So um, we, we hope this is something that, um, you know, residents appreciate. Next slide, please. Again, this is uh, this is a standard unit, so a little bit larger. You know, probably more appropriate for a couple, or you know, maybe um, maybe uh, you know, two students could share or something of that sort. Again, you know, we're we're excited to, to house a lot of different types of people. Um, and then you can go to the next slide, please. And here's the extended unit, which is a little bit larger. You could probably play with the floor plan a little bit more with furniture and things like that. Just a, a little extra space. And, and this is uh, an example of one of the larger decks. And I, we have a, quite, a, quite a large number of, of units that have decks. And um, so we're excited to provide that. Next slide, please. And so the amenities overall, as, as I discussed, um, or I'm sorry, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we really wanted to make the building um, the amenity space because the units are restricted. So uh, the first floor um, on that, that ground floor area, we have a spa area, and then we have a, a, a small spa that people could use. And then that leads up to the second floor, that podium deck that is at uh, 10,000 square feet, um, just over. We have that game room and fitness room that Ryan mentioned. And then on the sixth floor, we have a recreation deck and, and community room. So really uh, hoping to break out the building and, and have you saw there's certain setbacks and um, Architectural articulation that accommodate these that kind of serve to to provide that Spanish colonial style and also serve as amenities to the residents. Um, and, and as Ryan mentioned, all of these units or sorry, all of these amenities would be um, accessible to everyone living in the building. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, parking. Um, I apologize. I, I put up a, a wrong number on this, but Ryan did go um, for the surplus. Um, but with ADA, we do have eight guests. We have four commercial. We have 20. And I apologize, I miscalculated on the residential. Um, 
I'd have to go back to Ryan's slide or look at our plan set. But there are 139 out of all of them, the 209 that are EV compatible. Um, some of the ADA are EV compatible and commercial as well. Um, the private bicycle parking, uh, the lockers, as Ryan mentioned, every SRO is required to have a private locker. And in those lockers, we have a hanging bike rack um, that, that is uh, secure. Uh, additionally, we have a 72-space um, bike cafe that Ryan highlighted. 62 will be for the private uh, residents and then um, or, and, and visitors and whatnot. And then we're going to allocate 10 to the bike cafe for people frequenting the commercial or who works there. And then additionally, we have actually have 17 um, uh, bike racks out on the sidewalk. So again, you know, there's discussion about proximity to the transit. Um, we really want to promote um, alternative uses here and, and and us as a community, you know, it, it's, a, it's a delicate balance of, uh, by providing too much parking and kind of enabling the use of cars. And also, but, you know, uh, we still, still, people still need to park their cars. We want to encourage other uses such as, such as um, bike use and, and close proximity to transit. Next slide, please. And just to, I mean, Ryan went up uh, pretty thoroughly, um, but just to highlight, you know, the, the Beach and South Memorial Plan, it, it is uh, a little dated. It was adopted in 98. Um, and so we just want to highlight, you know, there are some, um, I guess, more subjective call outs, but again, what was objective in there and, and I, the overall, we were hoping that we were meeting that. And we do have that large street frontage. So overall, that, that total setback from the curb is going to be 28 feet. There's 13 and a half uh, feet of sidewalk and a 16 foot setback. Um, so we're hoping that promotes street activation. Center Street is considered a connecting um, avenue to the beach. I think it's, it's certainly overlooked uh, because of uh, Pacific Avenue and Front Street. And, but that overall beach and South Memorial Plan calls for that, you know, that connection, that tree lined street uh, with palm trees. And just really kind of incubating people and, and, and creating that connection. Uh, again, the, those setbacks, a lot of those setbacks um, and, and our waivers, uh, you know, we aren't trying to impose on setbacks that to where the building, you know, is inappropriate. We're really just trying to accommodate that type of architecture and accommodate the unit. So on the front setback, I believe the only uh, waiver component would be the um, the street front. Um, Staircase that that kind of um, it articulates out a little bit and then goes back in. So it creates that kind of diversity on the on the face of the building uh, to accomplish the uh, Spanish uh, colonial revival. Additionally, we have um, our retail and lobby on the frontage, so we're really hoping that stimulates um, some commercial activity, especially with all the events that will go on at Eco Park. And you know, I'm hopeful that maybe those tenants will work with the city and maybe doing a parklet program on the street. I think that would be really nice and help connect people down to the beach and kind of lead the eye up to downtown uh, and Laurel Street. Uh, the connection, you know, right across the street from Depot Park, uh, less than a half mile radius, there's I think at least eight bus stops, seven or eight bus stops. We're literally down the street from London Nelson Community Center, walkable to Neary Lagoon and the Santa Cruz Riverwalk, and you can connect to the rail trail that the city has been, um, you know, doing a great job of completing. So we're really excited to have it connected. So there are, you know, all these uh, local amenities and, and people don't need to get in their cars. No. Next slide, please. Uh, green energy is just like the highlight that we will have solar on the roof um, and per code, uh, this building will be 100% electric, so we are um, adhering to everything we want this building to help the city meet its greenhouse gas uh, uh, goal. And uh, Central Coast Community Energy, 3CE, is considered renewable energy for there, and uh, that's where the city sources its power from. And so we are um, we're working with the city on that, and um, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. And finally, I know it's on everyone's mind, as it should be, um, water demand. Uh, this, we, we do have a letter from the water department that um, they can provide service. It is a developed lot with existing water, and I've spoken to them about it, and they, they do not have a concern. 
Most recently, I think what's really highlighted um, kind of the state of, of our city and region, the lookout article in uh, the end of September, and it was presented by the water department. So we are actually consuming uh, similar rates to, um, similar to 1981. And that's with a 44% increase in population while achieving a 45% reduction in water use. So, uh, and that's due to water efficient fixtures, smart meters, improved infrastructure and community education. And so we've done a really good job uh, as a community to, to not be uh, wasteful of a precious resource. And um, that article was summarized by saying, you know, our need for housing um, and when we're smart and building about it, um, it's not going to impact what we really need storage during these wet events as they are getting um, smaller every year. And additionally, just from a, a, a regional standpoint, the Mid-County Groundwater Basin, they're the, uh, they submitted their groundwater sustainability plan, and that uh, was most recently re required by the state of California, and they're the first full basin to be approved by the Department for Water Resources. So I think regionally we're doing a very good job, and so I just wanted to touch a lot of people have concern, as, as you heard in open comment, people are concerned about a new hotel, and um, as, they, as they should be. So, um, next slide. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, yes, so this is uh, heading north on Center Street, just to give perspective, and you can see that, that, that fitness room and the staircase that leads up to the deck. Uh, you know, the closest building to us, we, we pulled so you could see the map being of the building. Uh, next slide, please. And again, uh, heading south on Center Street, uh, Scott's auto body and the separation uh, wall and plants are not there, so you can see the map in the building as well. Next slide, please. And this is a little bit closer. And, and yes, as Ryan mentioned, I think rendering doesn't really do it justice as far as the setback. And I'm not sure it's about the depth issue, but um, there is actually, a, from the face of curve, a 28 foot setback. So. Uh, and then you can see all those five racks we're providing, and you can see in this one too. So. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> you can go to the next slide, right? And again, this is uh, just the crops from Depot Park, and you just kind of get deep a feel for it there. You can see the rooftop, um, the recreational deck uh, on the sixth floor that's stepped back, and we have some architectural features such as the, um, the bell tower. So, uh, next slide. So again, thank you for your time. Um, I'm here to answer any questions and more specifically for architecture, so is David. Uh, we hope that uh, tonight you guys um, can uh, feel you can support our project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there commissioners with questions? I have uh, a couple. I you were talking about the balconies. It seemed from the from the unit plan that the balconies were really very important. It wasn't clear what percentage of the units would have balconies, and would they be as equally distributed for the affordable units as for the market rate units? To the extent that not every um, unit would have a balcony. Mm -hmm. So I don't. Um, Ryan, I'm my plan set and I can share. I don't I don't know if that's possible or um, I we could go back to your uh, plan set and I could or your presentation I could describe where those balconies are. Well could you give an, an overall uh, percentage for the number of units that have balconies? Uh, certainly I, I'm just looking at the plan set in front of me. Um, I can I'm not sure if David could speak to that. So just in looking at the second floor, we have um, Are you guys able to see what the plans? I so, think you're in the basement. So my I guess you're on the first floor. Yeah, so if you want to go to the second floor, Ryan, the next slide, we could speak to those balconies. Because all those ground floor units, um, they have some, I believe, except for one. So here um, I mean, we've tried to allocate it, and, and some were highlighted green, some were not, um, and maybe those were the Juliets that weren't highlighted, because technically they're not supposed to go out on them, it's just an opening. So, so the ones that are highlighted green are ones that you can actually go out on, 
the ones that do not have um, that are not highlighted green it looks like our our Juliet and they're not meant to go out on um, so I would say you're probably looking at maybe 75 80 percent of them what's your intention in terms of distributing them among the affordable 31 affordable units you know honestly I, I did not really think about that distribution and and tied to that is how those units because certain micro units only have Juliet some some do have balconies I think we did try to provide so um, I mean it's certainly possible that that can um, be accommodated okay and I guess the other question I had had to do with the amenities of the project which are pretty impressive. And in the staff report, it was uh, made, uh, it was stated that those amenities would be available to everyone. Uh, the management plan um, doesn't, as I read it, in my memory of it, doesn't really speak to that. Um, and I wondered, is it the intention to make those amenities, except for parking, of course, available at no cost? And is that uh, a reasonable, would it be reasonable to add that as a condition? Um, yes, I think it's reasonable to add that as a condition. But we, we, as you as you may know, we've worked on quite a few buildings throughout downtown, and we have never um, done anything like that of separating amenities to uh, a unit that would be DMR. So that is not um, one. I don't believe it's legal uh, through fair housing practice, and that's not something that we would have ever needed to be required as a condition. Uh, everyone that gets to live in this building gets to be a part of this community and gets to utilize all the amenities. Um, and, and if there were a restriction, then that would mean that there'd need to be someone policing that. And um, I don't think anyone wants to do that or see that happen in our community. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are my questions at this time. Um, do any have questions. Is it possible to get a show of hands of the number of uh, members of the public who want to speak to this um, project? Seeing a bunch of hands go up. Um, okay, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to since the, the step presentation was fairly long and the developer had a pretty good amount of time. I'm going to give everybody three minutes to uh, make their presentation. And I'm going to start with uh, Rafa uh, Sonnenfeld. We have three minutes and you're on. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm calling uh, for myself as an individual as well as on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB and um, EMB Law. Um, uh, we are supporting the staff recommendations to approve the project with the uh, listed standard conditions. Um, you know, this is a good infill project. It's close to bus line. It's going to offer uh, much needed housing that's likely to be used for by students and young professionals. Um, this one project alone will provide over 17% of the city's very low income housing RENA need. Um, clearly, that's going to be more in the future, but but uh, we are not producing that housing now. And um, as was mentioned in the report, uh, you know, these kinds of the projects are are the most needed in community right now. Um, I also just wanted to mention that the Housing Accountability Act requires the city to approve this project. Um, there are no health or safety impacts that can't be mitigated, as noted in the staff report. And uh, so uh, the the city is actually legally barred from from disapproving this project, um, and uh, you're also uh, forbidden from placing any uh, conditions on the project that would uh, impact the feasibility of the for of the affordable units or reduce the intensity or or uh, uh, or or density of of the project that that's been proposed. Um, I. Also, just on a personal note, I'm excited to see projects like this that are uh, going in on the on Lower Center Street. Um, it'll help make 
our neighborhood um, more walkable and pedestrian friendly with uh, ground floor commercial storefronts. Um, so uh, please, uh, please approve this project this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is uh, Emily Ham. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. So good evening, Chair Schifrin and members of the City of Santa Cruz Commission. My name is Emily and I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. And I'm here to express our support for 130 Center Street and respectfully request your I vote for this project. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Santa Cruz County Business Council was founded in 1996 to provide a collective voice for countywide businesses and support a healthy local workforce. And a key component to that mission is increasing our local housing supply um, and reduce overcrowding and bring people closer to their jobs. Um, last month, our board of directors unanimously voted to endorse the project on the basis that it supports these goals and fulfills several city objectives, including the promotion of sustainable and compact community within defined urban boundaries, as stated in um, the uh, 2030 general plan. Um, and it also calls for transit-oriented housing, redeveloping underutilized sites within the down and along major corridors, increasing density, and facilitating housing, housing at key opportunity sites. The impact of bringing 31 very low-income households closer to where they work or study is immeasurable, but has the potential to reduce vehicle miles traveled and promote more walkable cities. Increasing our city's overall supply by the proposed 233 units is also critical to attracting and retaining professionals and students to uh, local economy. So I thank you very much for your leadership on promote, promoting affordable housing um, and a healthier, more equitable and environmentally friendly workforce. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Michael Lozo. I, I, I'm sorry if I mis mispronounced your name. Not a problem, Commissioner. Um, Mike Lozo, Local 270. Uh, we submitted the written comments earlier today that were referenced by Commissioner Spellman. Um, the concern we raised uh, is the city's relying on the infill exemption, um, Class 32 exemption under CEQA. Uh, in order to use that exemption, the city must have substantial evidence uh, that, among other findings, that, um, and uh, show that the approval of the project would not result in any significant effects relating to air quality. Uh, we submitted comments from an indoor air quality expert, Mr. Bud Opperman. Um, the project will introduce formaldehyde, which is a toxic air contaminant, to air inside the project that poses significant risk to future residents, as well as to the employees of the commercial spaces. Um, formaldehyde is a known human carcinogen listed as a toxic contaminant by the state. The Air District has a significant special for cancer health risk of 10 in a million. Mr. Offman calculated for the, for the residents that assuming the project complies with the California Air Resource Board's uh, air uh, formaldehyde requirements, which are called the airborne toxics control measures, uh, that the risk to the residents uh, would be 120 in a million, which greatly exceeds the 10 in a million threshold. Um, and also, even for future employees who would be less exposed, of course, um, he calculates a risk of 17.7 cancers per million. Um, and these, again, this is assuming that um, all the materials being used in the project will comply with the CARB rules. Um, I appreciate the fact that staff um, did take a look at our comments and apologize for the short notice on our part. But um, I would have to uh, point out that the Supreme Court disagrees with the response that staff provided you. Um, staff indicated that CEQA doesn't address impacts to residents or users of projects, and the Supreme Court actually said that's wrong in the case of Cal Building Industry Association versus Big Quality Management District. Uh, under CEQA, a lead agency must disclose and analyze, and I quote, impacts on a project's users or residents that arise from the project's effects on the environment. Here, the formaldehyde emissions are gonna come from the materials uh, in the project and, um, and those residents and users are entitled to the analysis under CEQA to determine whether or not there might be an impact to them. And the exemption is excluding you from looking at that. So we'd certainly encourage you to question whether or not the exemption is appropriate 
and consider preparing a mitigated negative deck at least, or um, perhaps an EIR if that's necessary. And with that, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person is Ryan McGrody. Minute. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm here. Uh, I'm a recent addition to the area and I've been calling in support of the project. I know that the area drastically needs more housing and in order to meet that goal, this project alleviates a great number of units. And as a citizen of the downtown as well, I know that this sort of development would help alleviate issues within the area in the sense that it would help uh, vitalize um, the, the, tra the walkable uh, area as was mentioned previously, and as well as, you know, providing opportunity for students and young professionals, um, even those that are, <clears throat> this is the sort of opportunity that this city shouldn't pass up on. And I would highly recommend an approval on a yes vote. Okay, thank you very much. The next person is Elizabeth Collin. Um, you're up. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time. I just wanted to give my perspective as a here in Santa Cruz. Um, I have a good friend who lives in a 300 square foot studio on Beach Hill. And prior to that, she did what many of us do um, in looking for affordable housing in Santa Cruz, and that's go on to Craigslist and find a room somewhere um, in a house where you split different people and, you know, at 32, she was just like, I can't live with random people anymore telling me I can't use the kitchen or, you know, I'm not doing something to their approval. And so she found this studio and she's so happy. And it may not be the cheapest place to live in the city of Santa Cruz, but we need small rental options like these for people who see significant mental health benefits from not having to share living spaces um, with, with random people they meet on Craigslist. Some of those situations can be good and some of them are disaster. And so I just really urge you to think about options for people um, in, in the rental market here in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next and last person who has his hand up is Henry Hooker. So if there's anybody else who wants to speak on this matter, please raise your hand or some other way notify the clerk that you do wish to speak. So Mr. Hooker, could, uh, you're up. You have up to three minutes. And you need to unmute yourself. How about that? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Okay. I'm excited that there are 233 units of housing, 31 of which will be very low income. The project is a friendly addition to the neighborhood, close to transportation and services, and there's reason to believe that the required parking will actually be utilized due to its walkability and its proximity to transit, which is a very good thing. I hope that this project will have your unanimous approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken who would like to speak to this project? Not seeing anyone, so I'm about to close the public hearing. That is your last, oh, whoops. There, I just saw somebody new. I'm uh, Zenin Liadi Crow. Uh, sorry if I murdered your name. <laughs> No good, no good, no worries. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Zenon. I'm a first year here at UC Santa Cruz and I'm just calling in this project and actually imploring you guys, uh, if possible, recommend lowering the parking minimums so we can make sure we can get this housing more affordable for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I don't see anybody else's uh, hand up, so I'm gonna close the public hearing and bring the matter back to the uh, commission. Would they have questions and, and comments and discussion? Who would like to go first? This is Spellman, Commissioner Spellman, go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to thank staff, thank uh, the public for their correspondence, very thorough presence. Um, I think this project is an example of something that we're going to probably see, be seeing more of. Um, we have projects taking advantage of the new state laws, and the part that I take solace in with this project is, is there's obviously <clears throat> been quite a bit of attention to designing a building that's appropriate and still taking advantage of adding the additional units, which I am fully in support of. Um, yes, it's um, tall and large, but the building is very well articulated. Um, it's going to, you know, area of Center Street, which is sort of, uh, aside from the soccer fields and the usage down there, it's going to put people down there uh, and really take ownership of that area. Um, I think it's a good start to um, potentially, you know, adding substantial housing to that whole neighborhood. Um, so I am uh, in full support of this project. Uh, I've thought about this quite a bit. I've asked questions about um, density bonus law and the impacts of those to this project and others in the future. Um, I don't think we have much ability to um, stop, essentially, the increased densities that are going to come with the state density bonus law projects. and. Even if we had objective standards in place, the incentives that were requested on this project will be in play, right? We wouldn't have the ability to stop the additional height or the setback issue, even if we had objective standards that address that. So I want to commend um, the presenters and the owners of this project for designing a sensitively um, you know, community-based project, which, you know, I think will be a very nice amenity to, to the downtown. And I'm ready to move the project for approval uh, after other comments. Thank you. Uh, does somebody else have comments that they'd like to make? Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, um, thanks to staff and thank you for the public, uh, for the written correspondence showed up today to speak. Um, I just want to uh, take a step back and I think, uh, you know, make a comment around that, that I actually believe there's substantial evidence available um, to support that uh, there's a re reasonable uh, possibility of there being significant environmental impact and that a categorical exemption is not fit for this project. Um, you know, due to the location of the project, due to the size of the lot, location in, in, uh, in proximity to the wharf and to um, the boardwalk. I really feel that this project requires a full CEQA analysis. Um, and, and, then, and then we'll have more information to inform, inform our decision. But I don't think the categorical exemption is appropriate for this project um, because there are unusual circumstances. I don't think the staff report or the available information provided substantive evidence um, that this wasn't an unusual circumstance. And so um, I really believe that there should be a full CEQA analysis. And I just want to make a couple general comments um, that um, I, I absolutely agree with um, Commissioner Snellman in that state law is, is driving what, what's coming as far as density goes. Um, but the, the fact that um, as we're thinking about these projects, um, I, I would at least hope that we could have more discussion around the fact that our infrastructure in the city was not laid out for these high densities. And if we're going to have the opportunity to mitigate these densities that are coming our way, we're going to need the maximum of that amount of information available. So this is an example of wanting the maximum amount of information available including a full CEQA analysis so that we as commissioners and the public have all the information that we can. And if there are challenges around a development that we have the opportunity to mitigate them. Um, I think there's some real challenges around and traffic. Um, yes, there is traffic there, but this is going to bring more traffic. 
And I don't think that that's the analysis available really took that into account. And then um, I just want to publicly state that I'm very frustrated um, and I understand the constraint around our ability to do anything around um, the percentage of affordability, but 13% is not enough um, as far as affordability. And I hope that um, my fellow commissioners will consider um, reinstituting the housing subcommittee to uh, think about revolutionary because of these density bonus laws and because that's applied to these base units. We're getting stuck with these available, these affordabilities that is far below our requirement, right? So this is 13% if this project is approved as, as proposed to us. And that is not enough to meet um, the need of this community in, in, in these affordability units. So um, I'll leave it there and thank you for letting me rant a bit. Other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Greenberg. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and thank you. And I um, uh, am quite supportive of the project and the need for density and uh, a mixture of, of housing types uh, downtown um, and on, on corridors. Um, one of the questions at the end by the public was of interest to me, um, having to do with whether um, the parking requirements might be limited in this and I was, you know, interested to hear others, you know, opinions on this. Um, I know there's concern about, you know, lack of parking being associated with street parking, but my understand is that my understanding is that um, in the downtown and south of Laurel area, it would be a pretty straightforward place um, to lessen parking requirements as street parking is already regulated, and there's uh, from studies that have been done on the parking garage. There's, there's space available in uh, in the parking garages should people um, not have space um, in in the development itself. But in addition, um, it could potentially lower some of the costs of the units. Um, and I'm just curious, if, um, and thanks, yeah, if there's any thoughts on, on that particular suggestion. Um, my second point was just about my concern about the, uh, the, 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 um, the con about the concern about the formaldehyde and the building materials and if there's any consideration um, being taken into, uh, into mitigating that or using other materials. Um, and uh, and to, to echo uh, Commissioner Dawson, um, I am very appreciative of the 31 units. I recognize that if this continues that we will be kind of circumventing the 20% visionary by having these density bonus buildings that end up resulting in overall development with 13% affordability. And so I, I support the idea of um, studying that issue in a renewed um, affordable housing subcommittee. So those are my three points. But overall, um, you know, excitement about this, the direction that this, uh, this for, for needed units downtown. And thanks for uh, responding. Um, Claire, uh, about the, uh, sorry, Gallagly, about the, the question Hello, about- Hello, um, It's a tough one. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the question yeah, about- no problem. I, um, Thank you. Yeah, that would be a healthy question here. Um, it's, this location is not located within the downtown parking district. So a piece of clarification, these residents would not be eligible to buy permits within the existing parking structures there because uh, okay. the parking district ends at Laurel Street. Right now, there is a um, planning process underway looking at, and this is within that study area, and parking ratios are one of the questions that's being considered. Um, that wouldn't be retroactive, so it wouldn't necessarily apply here. Um, but yeah, what I would say is that's a bigger policy question. Looks like Eric has something to add there, but the, the one piece I really wanted to add is that outside the parking district, I think uh, Claire took the words out of my mouth. We're, we're right now we're in the real early preliminary phases of doing some work on expanding the downtown plan uh, south below Laurel. 
And so there's gonna be some outreach opportunities, um, public input um, that Matt's actually gonna to talk to you a little bit about towards the end of the meeting. Um, so that might be an opportunity to explore uh, like uh, uh, another parking district or expansion of the existing parking district or possibly reduce parking standards. Um, to your question about the formaldehyde issue, I did talk to the, our, our uh, green building uh, staff person and there are um, some points opportunities available for using um, formaldehyde free insulation. Um, and then also some um, uh, testing before the buildings are occupied. If, if it has a certain level of formaldehyde, um, it doesn't exceed a threshold. In other words, um, they can get points for that too. So um, there, there, are, there is some um, incentive in, in the green building code. Um, I think that was it, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so there are incentives, but there's no regulation. Well, it's, it's all regulated by Cal OSHA, really. Uh, yeah. It's not really a CEQA issue. So this is within those regulations, this level of formaldehyde. Yeah, I, and I'm not an expert by any means mm -hmm. on <laughs> formaldehyde and air quality, but we did, you know, we did, um, when we got the letter, we we, we read it um, carefully, we reviewed it with our, our city attorney, and um, they confirmed that um, it, it simply wasn't uh, a CEQA issue. Okay, thank you. The commissioners, uh, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, just uh, going back to the parking um, discussion we, that just came up. Um, I mean, there's a surplus of parking being provided in this product. Is that is that right? Okay. I mean, obviously, there's you know there's the minimum requirement, and and the, and the developer in this case is is choosing to provide a surplus. Um, for their own reasons, which you know um, th they know better <laughs> in terms of you know who who's going to be using it and who's not, I guess. Um, but um, but anyway, I just wanted to confirm that, that that's the case about the surplus. The um, the other thing is, in, just in terms of my comments, um, also I would like to thank uh, staff and um, the the public for um, all of their great comments today. Um, and um, I would like to just um, just state that I, I'm in very much agreement with what Commissioner Spellman said about the project uh, from an architectural standpoint. I think um, I think this project, uh, I think they've done a great job uh, with the design of this, and um, and I'm I'm very pleased uh, and and happy to to support this project. Um, one of the things that I do want to bring up. At, have to do with the, the living units, but actually, but has to do with the commercial space. Um, the I, I did notice on the plans that there was a call out for uh, potential grease interceptors um, within the two um, commercial spaces. Um, that the architect developer should should actually look into that to see if those can be inside um, from an environmental health standpoint. Um, I'm not sure that they'll be allowed to be inside the space, um, but because they are um, calling those out as as being in the space, I'm assuming that there there's a potential for uh, there being a restaurant use being in in those um, in those commercial spaces. And if that's then I would like to um, suggest that they provide some sort of um, ability to provide the necessary ducting for uh, for hoods within within their uh, the commercial kitchens uh, I did not see that in the um, in the floor plans above the commercial space um, and I think it's a good idea for them into account um, the I worked on plenty of projects where uh, within these types of buildings where there's where, with, with residents above, Commercial, and it's very difficult to deal with that after the fact. So, um, if they could deal with that now, that would be um, that would be ideal. So, um, just because it's much easier to deal with it right now. So, um, that's that's it. Thank you. Well, could I uh, follow up on that and see whether you would think that would be a reasonable condition to add 
I'm fine with adding the condition if, but I would like the, it would probably, I'd like to hear from the applicant if that's a condition they'd be willing to um, take on. Can we, uh, can we take a moment and hear from the applicant about that? Because I think that's a very, I know down on the mall, there have been terrible problems with uh, retrofitting buildings for restaurants that were designed for them. And the extent that there's any in, uh, uh, hope for having restaurants in the commercial space, and that is a you know a desirable use. Um, the point you raise is a really important one. So could I ask the um, applicant what the, whether they'd have a problem with uh, a, com a condition that uh, re re require the facilities to uh, assure adequate um, potential for restaurant use. So in, in this instance, and I, I apologize, my architect's having uh, trouble with the muted, but um, so we have vertical space next to the, the staircase and elevator. So of the two commercial spaces to the south towards the lobby, there's a staircase and elevator, and we have vertical space to go to the rooftop with mechanical equipment. So it doesn't interfere with uh, the restaurant. I think that's something that would come out during our design drawing and construction drawing. Uh, versus our um, uh, this this submittal package for for planning. Additionally, we would use uh, air scrubbers for for the smaller um, uh, commercial space. And and really, it's up to our tent. It's a potential tenant, of course, right? We have two spaces. There's potential for that to be combined and laid out differently. Um, so you know, we're trying we're trying not to uh, over over design it before we actually have a potential tenant there. But I think we can accommodate um, uh, air scrubbers and, and that vertical ducting. Uh, that would already, it, the building would already be designed to accommodate that. So would you be open to a condition just, um, just to ensure that uh, pro adequate space is provided for uh, future ducting of um, mechanical for, uh, for kitchen for commercial kitchen hoods? Let me let me just double check with my architect. I believe it's already designed. Um, yeah, he said that should be fine. We make space for that. So um, it, it's just not designed to that detail at this point. Uh, no, I, yeah, and I, I completely understand that it may not be. I think we just want to make sure that that there's um, in, in place. some some ability or, or just a condition that, that makes sure that you guys do take that into account. Yes, uh, we, we can do that. Okay. Thank okay, uh, Commissioner Conway, I saw your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I will, could echo comments from the commissioners. Um, and especially, I really thank you, um, you know, the, the developer, the staff, and the, and the community members have weighed in on this project. Um, it is, you know, in my mind, I mean, this is clearly an infill project that's badly needed. I also think that it was a really creative way to, you know, meet a lot of needs for residents um, while providing small units. The thing that I'll highlight about it, it that I really like is that it's a um, hundred percent rental project. It's always going to be a rental project. Um, the mapped projects that act as rental projects, I think are a real problem. Um, and particularly, in these projects with very small units. So I want to thank the developer for bringing a project forward that I think is actually feasible. Um, I also would like to echo um, that what several people have said, I wish that there was a way to get additional affordable units. Um, I think it is a really important um, question. On the other hand, I think that this is a feasible project. It appears to be and I think it will get built. And um, that's really good news for the community. And it will really activate that um, part, of the, part of the whole city, I think, will really benefit from the project. So thank you. Commissioner, comments? Um, I have a few. My main, uh, let me just first say, I agree with the, uh, um, with the, the comments about the quality of the architecture. Um, I was impressed with how, how it looked. And I recognize that I saw the, um, having a six-story building with 233 units is 
something that the city has very limited uh, review power over. Um, I am very concerned, as been suggested by other commissioners, about the number of affordable units. I, I think that's kind of one of the worst parts about the density bonus law is that it's supposedly for affordable housing. But in fact, we end up with a lower percentage of affordable units with a density bonus project than we would with a non-density bonus project. One of the things I wanted to thank the staff and the developer for providing was the drawings that showed the base, how the base density was calculated. And as we know, as we've learned, as I've looked, is the calculation of the base density in a situation where there's no density a limit on the number of units and for SROs there is no density limit on the number of units and what limits the size of the project from a, from a base density point of view is the uh, floor area ratio. So it was very useful to me to look at the drawings that were provided in, and how the base density was determined and my sense is that it, you know, since the base density determines the percentage of affordable units, and they can't be more than 20% under the density bonus law, then um, the the base density. A question about you know whether the the base density was really accurate or not. Was that the right you know was that a, a justifiable base density? And I recognize that if the base density is increased, the total number of units increase, but that would also increase the total number of affordable units. And one of my concerns with the way the base density is calculated is that the amount of parking that was, or the amount of space that was provided for parking kind of mirrored the amount of space in the proposed project, but the number of cars was that's re, that were required for the base density were um, significantly fewer because of course there are 155 units instead of 233 units. And it seemed to me that the, as if I understood cor correctly how the parking re was provided in the proposed project, there are about 167 parking spaces in the basement and then the rest of the parking spaces to get to the 200 were on, on the first floor. Well, that 167 parking spaces um, was less, uh, was more than was required for the uh, for the base density project. And so my sense is the with the base the base density in fact could be greater um, based on additional units being um, being provided on. The, and I, um, given you know the repeated concern about the need for uh, low-income units, very low-income units, affordable units, um, I I am concerned that this project isn't providing as many affordable units as it could, based on the calculation of the base density. So that's you know sort of you know a, a fundamental concern we don't have in our staff report. A real explanation about how you know you have that drawing, but that's a, you know that's kind of about it in terms of um, the justification. So I have a real concern about that, and wonder whether it would make sense to um, calculate it. I know it could lead to even a bigger project, but it would lead to additional affordable units. So that's one concern. The other concern I have is really about traffic. And maybe I missed it, but did we, I want to ask staff, did we, did the commission get the traffic study? Somebody got it, uh, but I didn't see it in our, it wasn't on my agenda. So I never got to, to read the uh, vehicle miles tra travel study. So. Um, I felt a little at a loss getting letters from people saying, you know, the traffic study was inadequate, it wasn't the right study. Well, we never, we never saw it. So I just wonder, did I miss it? Um, no, my apologies. Yeah, it, I did not attach it to the staff report. 
uh, but it is available on the on our project website. So that's why people were able to have access to it and, and see it. But uh, it was not something that I included with the staff report. So my apologies. So I, and it's relevant for a couple of reasons. Um, we've been told that you know under CEQA, the the city really only can look at vehicle miles traveled, not at level of, level of service. Well, this project isn't really subject to CEQA because it's getting, it's being recommended for a categorical exemption. However, some of the findings we have to make have to do with traffic. Uh, I think for the uh, special use permit, it talks about traffic. Uh, I think the coastal permit talks about traffic. So traffic is a concern and I guess I mean, my feeling is that um, it's, you know, given the amount of traffic that, that's there in the weekend, during the week, um, it, it is a legitimate concern, at least mission. I was concerned, uh, and I did mention this to staff, that the, the staff report didn't talk about traffic at all. It didn't talk about T, uh, transportation demand management. There's no requirement for bus passes. Um, you know, I think there's very limited um, conditions that the city can impose that would have, you know, a significant amount of traffic. And I understand that we don't have objective standards about traffic, which I'm hoping the commission will think about when we finally get around to talking about objective standards. But I do think that since we, we need to make findings about the traffic, we at least should have information uh, to what the uh, traffic impacts are likely to be um, and whether there are any reasonable uh, transportation demand management in, um, requirements. Maybe there should be a few zip cars. Maybe the development could offer some bikes to check out to residents. There is a variety, or there are a variety of transportation demand management issues that I think, um, or proposals that, you know, are not inconsistent with the direction that the that the applicant said they want to go in terms of encouraging people not to drive, but it's not considered a legitimate, at least as far as the staff report is concerned, and I and I I think that's problematic. In, given the findings that we're being asked to make. The final issue I have, and it kind of mirrors what uh, Commissioner Dawson talked about, um, has to do with the exemption itself. And I think we, I think the commission should have more information uh, about what the, uh, really justifies the exemption. I'm not, I, 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 I kind of agree with staff about the, um, the response to the air quality issue. Um, I don't, you know, the, you know, certainly CEQA's, you know, is concerned about air quality and the health of the public and the health of the, that could be generated by the project. But on the other hand, I, while the study that was sent to us was a general study about, you know, building materials, there's nothing specific to this project that provides substantial evidence that in fact is going to be a significant impact. I find the letter convincing. However, I do think the point that uh, Commissioner Dawson made about the potential finding of unusual circumstances given how um, the scale of the project is so much greater than anything around it, um, I think we need some uh, response from the, uh, the attorney why, why there aren't unusual circumstances here that would justify a more detailed environmental review because I think there are real, um, you know, there are unusual circumstances and um, there are visual impacts and traffic impacts <clears throat> that um, if there is a finding of unusual circumstances could uh, provide a fair argument that there is a potential of significant impact. So I do have these three concerns 
they're in the context of um, being supportive of the project overall. Uh, and frankly, if there are more affordable units, I'll be uh, willing to blink about some of my other concerns because I think the affordability is so important. Um, but I think these other concerns are legitimate. And I think the concern about the base density is very much to the point about what the number of affordable units um, should be. And I think what it all said to me in the end is that we really, when we get these properties uh, with uh, these density bonus projects, we really need to take a very close look at how the base density is calculated uh, because that's the only area we, where we have some uh, potential uh, discretion to um, determine how many affordable units we're going to get from the project. So I guess in the end, um, I would, given what's before us, I would support continuing this project so that we could get a reevaluation of the base density uh, calculations. We could get uh, additional evaluation on the um, you know, traffic, you know, the unusual circumstance development. Um, did the applicant want to say something? I Sorry, was there was there a question for us? No, I'm just I was just making my um, making a recommendation. The staff want to respond uh, to the concerns I've raised at this point. I'll start with the maybe the sequel question, and then if Sam or Ryan want to weigh in on the base density, they can they can do it. But um, so in our mind, um, something unique or, or unusual with this parcel might have to do with, um, let's say hypothetically, it's in a high archaeological sensitive area, and we have a report that indicates that there's strong likelihood that uh, resources might be present. Or maybe there's um, uh, a, a creek with sensitive vegetation that crosses the site. Those are the unique circumstances or special circumstances that would take this out of being um, exempt or eligible for infill and kick it into possibly doing an initial study. Um, we really don't have that here at all. It's, it's a, it's a, a infill site almost completely paved over um, with respect to the um, concern or comment about um, infrastructure, our, our public works department and water department um, each looked at this application. They didn't express any concern with respect to um, our, the ability to serve projects. So um, we really didn't see anything whatsoever that's unique or special that might warrant a more in-depth uh, environmental review. Okay, so did somebody else on the staff want to, yes, Samantha? Um, I'll, I'll just add to that. It, there's, there is case law, it's the 2011 Walmer v. the City of Berkeley that um, tells us that the increases in density and variations that are approved with a density bonus are considered consistent with the general plan and zoning. So they, you know, in itself wouldn't disqualify a project from using the infill exemption. So um, that would still be an appropriate exemption for a density bonus project. I'm not sure I get that. I mean, how does that deal with unusual circumstances? It's the the structure would be more than twice as high as anything around it, and the number of units is far exceeds any project in the area um, in terms of the and the, in terms of the potential traffic. So it's not a question of whether it's consistent with the general plan because it clearly is. Um, it's a question of whether environmentally there are uh, unusual circumstances that are different from anything else, you know, nearby. That's correct. And so per our um, CEQA consultant, 
Um, the unusual circumstances finding is really based on what's coming out of this particular project. So what's particular to this project that would not happen or occur with a similar project, a similar size or density in that same location. So, um, you know, we don't find that there's anything that's particular to this project that wouldn't be, um, you know, something that would be an impact from any other project. Um, are required for us to find with the infill exemption are all being met consistent with the general plan designation and zoning. The site's five acres or less and surrounded by urban uses. It's not a habitat for endangered or rare threatened species. There's no significant effects related to traffic noise, air quality or water quality, and it's adequately served by utilities and public services. So um, that's how we got to that, that finding. Okay, uh, in terms of traffic, that way will be the commission didn't get to see the analysis that documents that. Is that correct? I mean, it, you're you're basing that on the vehicle miles travel study that was done in terms of saying that there were no significant traffic impact. Is that correct? Yeah, Claire, do you want to jump in on that? I, I'm happy to. Yeah, I ran the BMT analysis on on this project, and there, even even if you did a full environmental analysis on it, what traffic there would be no significant impact via the transportation. Element here. It, uh, this project screened through as being far below our thresholds of significance, uh, both on a map based and on a project numbers in compliance with SB 743. Well, I'm certainly happy to hear that, but it would be useful if the Commission had the uh, ability to read the uh, analysis. Uh, before um, I take Commissioner Spellman and Commissioner Dawson. Did staff want to respond to the concern about the base density calculation? Yeah, I was just, I was taking a look. I, I was trying to uh, understand your thought process on parking. And so I was just taking a look at the parking requirements on the base um, and calc that with the base project, 154 parking spaces would be required to providing 166, so 12 surplus. So I, I'm trying to understand your argument or your, your thought process in terms of, are you saying that that 12 surplus spaces should be, or in theory- well, how, many how many spaces are provided in the proposed project in the basement? I'm sorry? How I'm many sorry. spaces are provided in the proposed project in the basement. In the basement alone or just total? Yeah, just in the basement alone. Oh, okay. I'd have to, I'd, I'd, I was just looking at the, the tables. I didn't look, I didn't actually go to the basement site plan. While you're doing that, Commissioner Spellman, do you want to? Yeah, my comments were, we're going to talk about this point. Um, at first glance, it does appear that, you know, there's an equal amount of parking in the base density to, and versus the project that's being proposed. Um, if you look a little closer, you look on the ground floor, um, there's actually 30 units on the base density scheme on the ground floor versus nine units on the proposed scheme. And on the next level up, the base density unit, there's 57 units compared to 48 units on the proposed scheme. So, I mean, I think they've, they've tried to, you know, appropriately uh, scale up the base density unit to try and fit in as many, many units as they could. Um, I don't see it as being a, a bad comparison. I think there's, they came down in density as far as number of units per floor. Um, I'm seeing 140 spaces in the basement and 26 on the first floor for the base density uh, plans. But what about the proposed plans? On the proposed plans. I got a couple different plans here. Uh, let's see, this one here. 
<clears throat> On the proposed plans, the basement has 155. 54 on the first floor. So in the base density, it was 140 in the basement. But if they put 155 in the basement, they could add additional units to the first floor. That's the point that I'm trying to make, that they could push all of the requirement, if not all of the requirement. I counted more, but maybe you're right. Um, the, by counting the same number, providing the same number of parking spaces in the basement as they were providing on the first floor, uh, as they were providing um, in their proposed project. I see the developer, uh, Mr. Bristow's hand up. Did you want to speak, Mr. Bristow? Sure, sure. And um, so I, I just want to clarify regarding the three-story model, the conforming model. Um, if you look at those plans, that is a circular building. And yes, we had more units on the ground floor. And uh, what happened with the density bonus is it actually allowed us to open up the building for solar orientation to have that for those commercial spaces on the ground floor and, and allow those, those extra units to have all those amenities that we discussed. If you look at the conforming, you know, it is a very tight building with 155 units because um, when that density bond is applied, we can allocate those. So um, that ground floor, or I'm sorry, that basement, we added more stacker parking um, uh, units so we could more efficiently park the basement and still accommodate those extra density bonuses, uh, bonus units, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, and I guess my point is the fact that you did that for the proposed project, for the density bonus project, um, at least said to me that it could be done for the base density project. And if it was done for the base density project, there would be more space on the first floor for it. Yes, so we, we did everything we could to make a livable conforming uh, project. I, I, I'm in favor of providing more units. Um, it was pretty tight with 155 units and, you know, again, these are SROs and we have to have some amenity space. So to provide more units to, to get more affordable, I, I see the intent, but over 165, we designed it very efficiently and, and it was very tight. So by able to utilize the density funds for creating a, a better living space overall and in our opinion, a more open building and, and better architecture. I don't disagree with that, but the, my concern is the number of affordable units. Um, but Commissioner Dawson, you had your hand up, and then Commissioner Nielsen. Yeah, I just want to um, quickly bounce back to the, the unusual circumstances and the case that there is case law around defining that. And um, I just heard staff mention air quality. So there's, there's inside air quality and outside air quality. And we all know if we've gone through this area pretty much at any time, but certainly on the weekends that, um, that there is a issue already. So it's not going to take much to increase the time of idle um, for that traffic in that area as that's going to uh, potentially cause a significant air quality impact. Um, but my point in, in continuing this and asking for a CEQA analysis and saying um, and continuing the categorical exemption is, is in this case is to give us that information. If, if there isn't going to be air quality impact, we need more information about that. And the categorical exemption just assumes that we're not gonna have any environmental impact. And I don't think that's about appropriate for a project of this size. So I, again, really hope that we can um, continue this and, and ask for a full CEQA analysis. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen, did you have your hand up? It did, but it was only, it only had to do with the base density um, discussion. So, I mean, and it's not really so much a, a question. It was just more of a comment, but um, if we want to continue that conversation about base density, we, you know, I'm fine to, 
to speak up about what I was going to say. Well, um, I, I, uh, I, I think you should, because from my perspective, that's still an issue that, um, you okay. know, we're not talking about the amenities. We're talking about the number right. of understood. Water understood. So basically, in looking at the, when I look at the drawings on the, for base density, I, I'm not. Um, I understand kind of. I think what you're expressing about having enough parking to add more units, but what I don't see is the ability to add more units, um, unless you can express like where you think they would fit. I, I in looking at the floor. Um, the, the way that the way that this is shown, there's just I, I don't really see a way to get more units on the ground floor. And then as you go up to the second and third level, it's it's basically a complete you know ring of units. And they need they, they do need a certain amount of light and ventilation um, provided to those units. So I'm not sure I'm following exactly kind of where you think that those units might come from. I guess my my thought was that. If the parking on the first floor was eliminated, that would create space that could be used to provide units. And just did all parking at the ground under yeah, underneath. all the all the parking would be in the basement. That that's was my um, that was my analysis. I mean, I I I could be wrong, but I think um, the issue is so the issue of getting additional uh, affordable units if possible. Is such a major concern that I think it's worth taking the time to get more information about it. Commissioner Greenberg and then Commissioner Conway. And just on that point, I'm curious about there wasn't really a response to why there's the felt need for the surplus parking um, above and beyond the requirement. I don't know if that would relate to your point about fitting the parking on the I think that's a different issue. Um, Is that a different issue because it's to do with the, the density bonus project? And not yeah, the... yeah, because it's the, the, there are parking requirements, and um, so there weren't surplus in the base density. I don't think so. Okay, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to. <clears throat> uh, comment. Um, first of all, I, I uh, share your interest in um, fiddling with a very complex project, but I want to point out that I really don't think it's our role to redesign the project at this point. In time. We've been, a uh, project has been brought forward to us that has considerable study behind it. Decisions have been made that um, about you know, the amount of parking that can be done. I also, as I expressed, I wish that there was a way to do more affordable housing. We don't have those tools right now. This is a strong infill project and um, I'm, I'm not going to support a continuance. I think this is a project that's ready to be um, approved tonight. Okay. Um, you know, my concern is I would like to support this project. Uh, I would like to uh, approve it. I think overall it is a good project. Um, it is our role um, as um, as being in terms of being concerned about the amount of affordable units to try to get you know to respond to a situation where we're essentially getting the only 31 units out of you know a 13 percent out of a 233 unit project. And I, I have concerns about that. And I think it is legitimate to, um, it's not tinkering with it. It's sort of dealing with, from my perspective, a really fundamental issue, which is how many affordable units can, uh, can be provided? Because I think um, that's, that's the critical need. There's a need for housing overall. There's a need for small units. I think the points that the members of the public made are really uh, valid points, but I think to the extent that uh, a few more affordable units uh, is worth um, pushing for. Yeah, and I just, uh, I, I disagree. I think that's a policy matter that um, there's been a lot of interest expressed in 
finding a way to address it as a policy matter. My point is that um, I don't think we have the tools to do that in this project, in this context. And the, the thing that makes it so difficult though, Commissioner Conway, is that there are no density limits. So normally you could say, okay, um, you can have 30 units an acre and with a density bonus, you can have 45 or you can have 60 and go up to, you know, there are normally in, the his, in history, there was the ability to know how many units uh, the general plan is only but this has been filled with in so many ways that we can't. So with SROs, there would be a million units. There's no limit in the general plan of the zoning ordinance. It comes down to this floor area ratio of how many can you squeeze on the, on the property. And so it, it, becomes, it becomes a variable rather than a constant. When you know what you're doing, uh, you have a constant. You may like it, you may not like it but everybody knows what it is. When you start talking about floor area ratio and base densities, it becomes a variable. And I think it is an area where the, um, the policy of trying to maximize the number of affordable units, that's the only area where the uh, city has the ability to come in and say, oh, look, there could be more affordable units here. Um, and you know, there's no magic to creating, uh, as it turns out, at least as, as I've calculated it, there's no magic in um, deciding what the base density is. Go to some ordinance, a general plan, and just say, this is what the, de the underlying density is. We don't have that anymore in much of the city or for different kinds of projects. So anyway, I don't know if uh, somebody's willing to make a motion uh, let's see if we can reach a decision on this. Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I'm ready to make a motion that um, the recommendation from staff, we are acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the non-residential demolition authorization permit, density bonus request to exceed height and reduce setbacks, special use permit, coastal permit, Design permit based on the findings below and the attached conditions of approval exhibit A. And I think we would include um, the condition well, to make sure the project accommodates um, restaurant vertical exhaust hoods. Okay, thank you. Is there a discussion? I'll second. I heard, I heard the second. Uh, uh, motion by Commissioner Spillman, seconded by Commissioner uh, Conway. Here, are there, uh, is there any discussion or um, alternate proposals? Okay, uh, seeing none, we're going to have a roll call vote. Commissioner um, Conway? Aye. Dawson? No. Greenberg? No. Maxwell? No. Nielsen? Aye. Selman? Aye. Different? Uh, no. Is there another motion? Sure, I'd like to um, make a motion to uh, continue this item um, with the direction uh, to staff to provide um, additional information on um, the exemption and uh, traffic study. Would you add about on the debt-based density as well? Yes, and debt-based density as, as well. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Um, can we, is there any further discussion? Yeah, um, go ahead. Well, I, I'm not as concerned, I have to say, with the CEQA and the traffic study. I'm convinced by what I've heard from the planning staff and I hear what is being said about the concern about the 
in and of itself. I think the point with the vehicle miles traveled is that the overall environmental benefit of having infill development outweighs you know, the kinds of impacts that local traffic might or might not have. The fact that we would be mitigating larger scale traffic on, you know, throughout the city and the region um, outweighs that from my perspective and the, so the benefits of infill development. Um, on the other hand, I'm really um, you know, interested in the point that was raised by Commissioner Schifrin about the potential for rethinking this floor area ratio. And, and, you know, and I think it's going to be a significant question for us insofar as density bonus buildings are going to be going up, how the base area density is being calculated um, is going to be very important for us. And so while I understand the concern about delaying this uh, any longer, I think it's important enough that, um, that we clarify that potential for increasing the number of affordable units based on the base area density. And so on that basis, I seconded the motion. Commissioner Scotland. Yeah, I think we're setting a very dangerous precedent here. I mean, we're, we're saying to the community that, um, you know, small unit rental apartment project, we're really going to, you know, put them through the ringer even further on clarification on a traffic study and a, a base density calculation. Um, look at the plans. The plans are using, they're adding small units from the proposed project to increase the number of units that they're able to fit on the, on the base density submittal. Okay, they're not going to get more units on, on that site. You can't just throw units in a garage space or on the interior portion of a, um, you know, the perimeter of a building. You don't, it just doesn't work that way. They have to have access to natural light and air and all of those things. Uh, I think the numbers are there. Could they reduce some of the larger units and get smaller ones? As I look at it even closer, I don't think so. I think the widths of those units are, are very similar. I don't think you're going to get, you, you know, even one or two more units than, than what they're currently showing. And I would guess that the developer would be incentivized to do that if they could. So I don't, I don't see us getting a larger base density number. And I think we're sending a very wrong message to the community that we're not, um, you know, supporting this project 100%. I don't see the issues being germane on, on this project. Yeah, well, I disagree. I, I think the message that we're trying to send is affordable, getting as many affordable units as possible. The, the density bonus project has on the uh, second floor a very open um, site plan with a podium in the middle. Um, I guess what I'm thinking is why can't that be on the first floor and for units that way? Maybe I'm wrong, um, but I think it's important enough to try to get additional affordable units to take a uh, take a meeting to find that to find that out. In terms of the the traffic issue, I have mixed feelings about it. I um, but. I, I'm always a little bit concerned about voting on something when I haven't re received the material. Um, I, just, um, uh, I think there are, uh, I'm prepared to be convinced that the vehicle miles travel study, the traffic study um, deals with uh, uh, the concerns adequately, but I'd like to see that study. And I think it's legitimate and it sends the right message to the community that the commission's not gonna make decisions without being fully informed. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to support the motion. Is there further discussion? Yes, Commissioner Nielsen it, and Mr. It looks, it looks like maybe the applicant um, has raised their hand. I can't tell because the screen's been taken over by the... Okay, let's go back. Oh yeah, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, That's Mr. okay. Christopher. Sorry, I just wanted to speak to the, the, the three-story model. So we, we have to provide, um, we are utilizing parking stackers for the residents. Those are controlled and managed by the management. And But as far as the commercial parking, we are required to provide standard parking spaces. So that's why the floor is open as you see it um, for, the, for the conforming model. And then also back of house connection for, for trash. Uh, um, as well as the storage lockers. 
design and the other one are correct. We um, we designed it as the best we could and we fit in as many as we could. The units are all the same width. The only difference is the length when you look at that unit blend. So um, as far as redesigning the project at this point to get more units, I, I don't think that is a feasible option for us at this point. Um, Commissioner Nielsen. I think, I mean, just, I mean, uh, just based on that answer, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with sending this back. I, I don't think we should delay this any longer. Um, I, I think we should, you know, we should vote on this project. I, I don't believe it should go back to redesign to the base density. Um, the, the answer that was just given is sufficient to me to know that they did the best they could and they got as many units as they could on the base density. Let me just, oh, Commissioner Greenberg, you had your hand up, go ahead. You're muted. I was just quickly gonna say that the staff didn't need to do anything else since they've already produced the traffic study. We just need to be able to, just to, we are to continue it. Uh, the issue would just be to read that study, but um, there's the question on whether we continue it and the response to Commissioner Nielsen. So I'll, I'll leave that open. Well, let me just say, it's not like we've continued this before. It's not like this has been before us for months. This is the first time we've seen it. Um, I think the questions that are being asked, I'll admit. Um, and also, as I understand it, there is no request that the project be redesigned. It's not that, the, you know, that's not the, um, the, at least that's not my intention. My intention is just to get a better understanding about and, you know, or some better justification for why the base density can't be increased. And then it's the, then it's the developer's uh, decision whether they want to redesign it or not, or whether they just want to ident identify a couple of more uh, affordable units. But I'm not convinced based on the, um, the the material that we receive that, you know, the base density can't be increased. And I'd like to see, you know, more of an analysis of that. We've gotten a few projects where staff has come in and said, this is the base density. And, you know, this is, you know, I think the, the commission, since it's the only area where we have any discretion at all, we have the, you know, we have a, responsibility to really determine whether it is the appropriate base density or not. Go ahead, Commissioner Nielsen. Yes. I mean, I, I just I just feel like we, we just heard from the applicant and they explained how they laid out the parking in the basement and how they laid it out at the ground floor. The ground floor is basically the 20 parking spaces that's required for commercial. Um, not commingling those spaces of commercial to um, to residential, and that's why those spaces are on the ground floor. And therefore, there cannot be any more um, residential spaces at the ground floor. That's how I heard it. And so, based on that information, I don't see how this could be how the base density could be increased. And I think that's what they're. That, I think that's the point that the applicant was making. Is that that's how they with this base density. And I wasn't saying that, that, that there's any request for redesign. I'm just saying that I don't think we need to send it back for them to relook at the base density because they've done that. They've gone through that effort and they have provided us with what they believe to be the, the base density for this project. Um, and, 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 and with the, with the information that they just provided about the parking, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. And I think the base density is what they show. Chair, this is the clerk. So, um, can we yes. get clarification from the maker of the motion exactly what the additional direction is? Because based on the conversation I'm hearing, it's not clear to me what staff is being directed to do versus what perhaps the applicant is being uh, required to do. And I need to make sure that's clear if um, to record the motion properly. Well, as I understand it, the, the motion is for the staff to come back with an analysis 
of whether the um, the base density could be increased or not based on the parking analysis. And I'm, I've been uh, a little distracted. I was trying to find where in the staff report it talked about what the parking requirements were and that somehow the um, parking for the, uh, with, if there's a requirement that the parking for the commercial has to be on the same floor or can it be on a lower level? Uh, I think, um, I'm not sure it has to be. And I, I just, it's worth uh, getting that analysis. Uh, so from, and the maker of the motion can correct me, but I think it, uh, it's not requiring an applicant to do anything, but asking staff to provide more of a uh, analysis of the, you know, the possibility of increasing the uh, number of the base density by reducing the amount of parking on the first floor. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind a little more clarification on that because I've been looking at it. I've been looking at it while we're talking, and I don't know what else and what other analysis there really is to do at this point. Um, it's pretty clear. Um, so if you have a specific thing that you think that is or has been done incorrectly or we've overlooked, I would appreciate some direction on that. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I've I've, I've been doing the exact same thing, and and um. You know, the thing we have to keep in mind is that we still need to provide access into the garage. So that eats up a lot of space on that first floor. And then when you throw in um, the uh, egress requirements, um, I, I think it's, it's very difficult. I mean, we've heard from the applicant that they've maximized density. We've got two um, design professionals that currently sit on the commission. And um, they, they're both of the opinion that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to increase density. So um, I, I, I'm not sure what more we can add to the um, analysis. So just, just for clarification, a lot of the things that have been said in, in the discussion over the last few minutes are not in the staff report. So what could be done moving forward is to clearly articulate these and and draw them out so it's easier for the public as well as all of the rest of the commissioners and how it was arrived at this space in addition um more information to around the categorical exemption um and specifically around how the, that this project will have no impact to air quality um and then a, additional you know, including the traffic study as part of the packet. Um, so again, the public has time to do all of this. Commissioners have time to be thoughtful that we have the most information available is really what this emotion is about. And then we can um, consider it and go forward from there. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just say I could be convinced, but I'm just con uh, I, I'd like to, and I'd like to, you know, I'd like to read the analysis. Commissioner Conway. I just wanted to speak against this motion. I, I think I already made my point, but I don't think we have a credible reason to delay this project. It's clearly an infill project. It clearly meets those requirements. And um, the traffic study has been available um, and so I, I just, I don't see that we have reason to delay. So I'll be voting against the motion. Well, let me just say about the traffic study, it would have been nice to have it mentioned in the staff report. So I would have looked at it. Um, yes, it's available, but I don't check out every, uh, the website for every project. I look at the agenda. That's the place to find the material. Um, okay, so we can go around and around on this. Is there any final um, discussion on the motion? I'm sorry, I, I'm still unclear on the motion in terms of the category, uh, category. Do you want from staff an analysis of how that was reached? Categorical exemption? I'm not clear what you want from staff to put in the motion about that issue. I would like to. Uh, staff to give more information about how this does not meet the legal threshold for unusual circumstances, specifically around 
environmental impacts around air quality. Um, so yes, more information about how they reach that determination and how it, they do not consider this unusual circumstances. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any further discussion on the motion? Commissioner Greenberg. Yeah. Um, so I, and by the way, I see that Jesse Bristow has his hand up and I, um, he Well, it's been up. I'm not sure it's still oh, okay. up for something new. Uh, yeah, I, I could provide some clarification, but I'll let Commissioner Greenberg speak and then I can respond to a lot of items. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, no, I'm feeling conflicted and I'm feeling like, um, you know, perhaps part of the issue is that we, this will be like a, you know, one option would, you know, be that this would be a learning experience. And in the future, all of these elements would be included in staff reports. Um, and, you know, that would be uh, one consequence of all of this. And I'm just wondering what can result from, uh, as I'm interested in hearing from um, Mr. Bristow about, you know, the potential for uh, further analysis of the base area density. Certainly. So um, I'm going to go through a, a couple line items, but just to point out, uh, the SRO ordinance requires individual storage per unit. So the more units we add on a base unit, we have to provide storage area, and then we have to provide ingress and egress. There is no more room to accommodate that. So even if we looked at the base density and tried to add more SROs, even if we did a couple more, we have to add another storage area where we're meeting those design requirements. That's, that's one item. Um, pertaining to the, the garage size as well, we were told by that we had to widen the drive aisle. By widening the drive aisle, it limited how many parking spaces we could have and, and how they were oriented, oriented in that layout. Um, so, uh, and then in regards to the air quality, and uh, I'll just try to respond in how I understand. So, per public comment, um, when we build something, demo something, we are required to, to adhere to Title 24 Cal OSHA standards, um, all, all those construction mitigation. We, we've been, we're a fourth generation construction company. We are aware of all those. Um, we've been building in Santa Cruz for over 30 years. So. We're aware of those, and, and we are will use best, best practices. Um, at, you know, we, we've done a lot of buildings, as mentioned, and we'll continue. You know, that's our reputation. Um, in terms of cars, uh, you know, I'm I'm a planner by trade, um, and so I do understand transportation analysis. You know, it, it's hard to regulate um, existing uses, such as the boardwalk, such as the wharf, such as the that tourist industry, which we depend on. And, and then, yes, also trying to balance residential uses in a traditionally hotel area, a visitor serving area. But it was identified as an opportunity area in, in the South Global Plan. So, uh, you know, again, it is that balance. Uh, we could, I think, in future projects, you know, or, or there was a blanket policy that said, hey, you know, reduce parking and also don't, you know, you put restrictions on street parking to really uh, promote people to use alternatives. I think that's appropriate, but to try to add it onto every project, I think it's inefficient. Um, additionally, we have 139 charging stations. I think that promotes electric and hybrid uh, mobility, which you know helps reduce um, gas emissions. So, uh, with that said, I just wanted to speak to the the bigger item is the uh, the affordable housing. And uh, although we're not required, um, and I think. Um, for the for the sake of of this project and, and moving forward, I think we would be willing to offer up four units additionally to to the total 31. Um, so that would be 35 units. Those units we could promote micro units. They would be the smaller units under the condition that that is the only condition to this project. There's no more discussion and it's not appealed to the city council. That I think we can offer to the city and as a benefit as the community in addition to the project. We don't want to continue it. We both want to provide housing now. And I think we could accommodate the planning commission with additional four units. Would 
you be willing to accept that as a, uh, make that as, include that as a condition? Uh, if, if it's allowed, I know someone mentioned about Housing Accountability Act, but if everyone's on board, I, I, we would be willing Well, but, you know, that, it's up to you. The city cannot, you know, the yes. commission can't impose it, but if you're willing to add it on a, as a condition, I'd certainly be willing to support the project tonight. Then, then yes, as long as that's the only condition and this project is not under the condition that's not appealed to city council. Well, we have no control over that, but if somebody does appeal based on the testimony we received, um, it doesn't seem like going to be anybody who will appeal it, but we can't control it. But then it's up to the city council to raise the discussion. So I'm, I, I'm satisfied with that. Um, with that concession, I'm very appreciative of um, the applicant for making it. And so what I would recommend if it's, if the maker of the motion is willing to withdraw their motion and, um, you know, uh, maybe make a motion to approve the project with this additional condition, uh, I think then, I think that would be, uh, I certainly would be willing to support that. So. Is the maker of the motion willing to do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to withdraw my motion and make a new motion for approval with um, two conditions, which would be the four units and then just that there there would be, uh, architects, you might have to help me, uh, the, the access for the, the kitchen access. Um, how how do, do we you, say that? Do you have any problem with, with that? Condition which was in the original motion. I do not. We 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 plan to do that anyway. So I think it's appropriate to have it in there to ensure. So thank you. So just so those those uh, role with those two conditions for the four additional affordable units, uh, micro units, and then the um, uh, ability the restaurant to, condition. The restaurant condition. So the, <laughs> For the restaurant, for the commercial space, whatever. Is what? that acceptable to the second? Yes, it is. There was is there no further second. discussion? There was. There, did she second that? She was on the withdrawn motion. He made a motion. I oh, know, I see. Second. Is there another second? I see. Okay, so I. Sorry about that. So I, I second, second that. Oh, okay. Okay. There's so a uh, motion by Commissioner Dawson, seconded by Commissioner Spellman. Uh, discussion. Commissioner Conway. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Bristow for offering that up. I think that um, meets an awful lot of our needs here. I just wondered if we needed to um, clarify that that condition will be nullified if this approval is challenged. Do we need to do something like that? I heard him say. Well, I, I, as I heard it, that's part of the condition. It is. Okay. The, the, the wanted condition to make sure would include it. these four units unless it, the project mm -hmm. is appealed to the council. Is that your understanding, Mr. Bristow? Uh, yes. Okay. Any further discussion? I, we just have a roll to, call. No. I just wanted to express appreciation to Mr. Bristow as well. I think that's great. Me too. Okay, so let's have a roll call vote. Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Griffin? Aye. So thank you very much, um, staff, and particularly the developer for your flexibility. And it's 10 o'clock. Um, do we want to, do we want to, there's been a bunch of concern about the next item on the agenda, uh, on the agenda. Uh, do people feel energetic enough to take it on? I know I have plenty of problems with it. And actually, my recommendation would be to continue it and send it to a reestablished housing committee, because uh, I think it raises a number of issues that need further discussion. But I'm willing to go through uh, sitting and looking and hearing from the commission, and otherwise, I would recommend continuing it. But what, if, what does the commission want to do at 10 o'clock at night? Commissioner Dawson, what do you want to do? I would move to con continue the motion and to um, to reconstitute the housing 
and you have it go to them and then you have a report back from the housing subcommittee? I'm not sure since it's a public hearing that we can just do that. We may need to open the public hearing, but okay. let's hear from other commissioners. It may be that we would open the public hearing and then I'll um, pop in here. if somebody really felt the absolute need to talk about it, then um, we could listen to them. But what are other commissioners, before we hear from Steph, what are other commissioners want to do? Commissioner Greenberg? You yeah. Um, I would be concerned that we wouldn't hear from the public because it's so late. Um, and so I would support continuing it, even while I'm you know, very interested in discussing it. Other commissioners, any preferences? Okay, let's hear from staff. Is there any reason we can't continue this? Hi, good evening, Commission. Um, so yes, we're all up a little past our bedtimes at this point. So um, there is no reason that you can't continue it. And um, I just have one favor to ask at this point. This item has been has had a lot of work done on it by our intern that's been with us this past several months. And um, so my only humble request uh, might be that we could hear the presentation and then take a motion to continue it um, just in the interest of him being here for a limited period of time. That's all. Of, of course, you're welcome you know, to continue it, to hear it in whatever manner you deem appropriate. There isn't any um, other sort of time limit or reason, you know, deadline for hearing this item. So it's, it's up to your commission. Okay, and so you're saying that the you will not have this in, the intern could not come to the next meeting to speak on this. He could come to the next meeting, but actually, so the next meeting on the fourth, we're hoping to bring you um, the objective standards for draft review, and I that to be um, a very lengthy discussion. So we're talking about potentially pushing this later in November, um, and he's only going to be with us through December. So. Um, you know, we could we could push it out a few weeks if you want to push it out and and then re-refer it to something else, and then maybe he wouldn't get a chance to go to a public hearing. That's that's my only request, and it's just a request. This is not you know a demand. There's nothing you have to do. I just it would be a favor to me. Let me see. But it might be helpful to him um, in terms of his work to meet with the subcommittee and talk to the subcommittee and have not just staff input but also commissioner input in terms of. Um, the work that he's done. So, I mean, I think uh, certainly I want to hear from him, but it sounds like it really isn't essential that we hear from him tonight. And it's useful to him, and I think will be useful to us. Uh, at least I, I really think we need, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a more detailed discussion. Now, we really can't set. Uh, it isn't on the agenda, so we can't re really reestablish the subcommittee tonight. So I think maybe what I would suggest, if it's okay, is that we continue this for, um, and on our next agenda, just reestablish the subcommittee. And then that would be something that the subcommittee could work on. Does that make sense? And I, uh, hopefully staff will make sure that this is a legal way to do it. Thank you for that. I was stressing out about that. I was like, it's not on the agenda. <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> I think that sounds like a reasonable proposal. I mean, Eric, did you have anything you wanted to say? Oh, we can't hear you. You seem to be muted, Eric. Sorry, I got two devices going here. Um, I, I was on the same page as Tess. We need to agendize the reestablishment of the co uh, committee. We can't do it tonight. So that was the only thing I was going to add. So um, what I would suggest is that we hear from anybody in the public who feels they need to speak tonight. Uh, since if they're still here, they've been waiting quite a while. But with the understanding that the commission is going to continue this matter and uh, send it to uh, Housing subcommittee when that is reestablished, hopefully at uh, at least to be considered. It's reestablishment establishment being considered at the next meeting. Um, so let me see if there's anybody from public who 
feels that they can't wait until this comes back. I see R Raffer, your Sonnenfeld, your hand is up. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I realize it's late for everyone. Um, and uh, we were looking forward to seeing the presentation on this item this evening. Um, once again, I'm speaking on behalf of MB um, in support of the, uh, well, most of the staff recommendations for the, um, uh, the small ownership unit SRO uh, new, new zoning type. Um, but we did have some concerns that um, uh, this change in zoning is going to increase the, uh, uh, the parking minimum requirements for SROs that, wouldn't, that currently don't have parking minimums. And, um, uh, and we'd hope that the commission uh, takes a strong look at eliminating the parking minimums for, for this, uh, uh, this new zoning category rather than um, increasing uh, the parking minimums for the SRO category, uh, which currently has zero. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Is that it? I don't see anybody else's hand up. So could there would and make a motion to continue this uh, item um, and to put an item on the next uh, commission agenda to reestablish, to consider reestablishing the housing subcommittee? I'll do it with nobody else. <laughs> um, I will move to continue this item and to agendize consideration of reestablishing the housing subcommittee um, at the, the next meeting um, available. Is there a second? I'll second it. I think the chair can second the motion just to move things along. Um, is there a discussion on the motion? Uh, Commissioner Greenberg. Well, I just didn't hear anyone. Maybe people feel like it's important to discuss this tonight. And I just wanted to know if that was the case. Um, and I mean, and I appreciate Sarah Noisy's concern about the intern, um, maybe that issue, but in addition, if there are other reasons why folks feel well, like I did ask if anybody really felt yeah. that we need to deal with it tonight. I mean, I just, you know, the last item took a lot out of me. I don't know if it took a lot out of other people as well, but <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, it's since there is no need to sign it tonight, um, I thought putting it off made sense. Commissioner Spellman, did you want to say yeah, No, I agree with that. I mean, this is not a simple issue, right? There's a lot involved here. The only thing, uh, you know, I, I personally learn by listening and seeing and hearing other perspectives. So this is probably going to take two or three rounds to, to flush out. Um, we want to put off the first round for a bit. I think that's fine. Yeah, I think it's a significant change. So it, it's worthy of having more detailed involvement. Uh, other commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Conway. I guess I'll just say that I, I would have preferred to um, proceed with the item, I think, and, and then continue it afterwards. But, um, you know, I'm not against it because I do think that we will, I think it was inevitable that we were going to take some time um, and go through a couple of, of uh, iterations. I just didn't see a reason to postpone it. Any other uh, commissioner comments? There's a motion on the floor to continue the item and to agendize the reestablishment of the housing sub next meeting. Um, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Conway? No. Dawson? Yes. Greenberg? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. Nielsen? Aye. Salmon? Aye. Griffin? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. I apologize to the intern. There, it's not unanimous. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't unanimous. It was six to one. Oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Conway. Uh, one of the reasons for putting it off. 
Okay, so we are now up to information items. Could uh, Seth give us some updates? Sure. Um, it's it's been a while since we've met, so um, before I get into the upcoming schedule and some of the projects we've got um, going, um, I'd like to have uh, Matt Van Waugh give you a brief update on a couple advanced planning efforts that are currently underway and um, how and, and when you're going to be involved with those. Great. Hi, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. This is Matt Van Waugh, Principal Planner. Uh, with advanced planning. Uh, so some, some updates as far as what's coming up next for planning commission, uh, the next 11 4, uh, November 4th, uh, we have our objective standards check-in where we're going to be sharing our, our first draft standards with you all and walking through the work that we've been doing since our previous check-in uh, earlier this year. Um, so that, that'll be an extensive meeting and we look forward to hearing your input on those standards that we've been working very hard to show you and Sarah's going to have a good presentation for you then. Um, and then just some other updates on that. We also have a, a community meeting on November 6th on a Saturday for objective standards. Um, and that's going to, I think that's tentatively planned for 10 to 1130, but there'll be a, a website and email blast going out uh, this week on that. And then the following week, we're anticipating having a downtown plan expansion community meeting on November uh, 13th, also on a Saturday. Um, and just a just a brief of uh, the commission on that. Um, in our schedule, we intend to come back to the planning commission uh, around February on the and expansion after, after these series of uh, community engagement activities uh, with with a draft development scenarios that would be in February. So a, a little bit further down the horizon, but uh, you can see how that that work is leading up to a, a, a February meeting with the planning commission on that. And then and as we discussed today. Uh, we'll be working with the Planning Commission subcommittee on housing uh, regarding the small unit ordinance and uh, hopefully coming back to that uh, potentially on November 18th. That's what I have to share right now for uh, coming up on my calendar here. Thank you. Any other information? I, hope? Oh, I, I do want to I do want to add one more thing. We're working on uh, our local coastal program update. and. Um, uh, to, to bring that up to date with our 2030 general plan. And uh, we also anticipate bringing that to the Planning Commission for the review uh, uh, sometime early in 2022, uh, either January or February. We'll be on the lookout for that as well. Thanks. Yeah, a couple uh, pro Oh, I'm sorry. I got one question. Since Matt, since Matt's here, I have a question. Is um, are is staff going to come to us at all, or is there a need to come to us about SB nine, um, and uh, standards, um, development standards regarding SB nine? We we are anticipating doing some kind of a legislative legislative. Uh, I can't say that word right now. <laughs> Legislative study session uh, with City Council, uh, and that that looks like early in the new year as well. Uh, okay. So that's something that potentially Planning Commission can can join in on to to see that. Um, but we we are working on going through all that legislation, and we're starting to put together guides and things like that that we'll eventually be putting. Uh, out on our out on our website at some point too to help uh, help the community along with that legislation as well. Uh, so be on the lookout. But we will have a formal meeting at some point, uh, probably early in uh, early in the next year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then to the extent um, uh, we need to do uh, code amendments, you'll of course be uh, making recommendations to the council for those as well. Any other um, yeah, yeah, a couple, couple of, Commissioner Dawson. 
Well, I just, uh, I'll go ahead, um, Eric, and then I can go with it. I just had a clarification about one of the reports that Andy or Chair Schifrin asked for. Um, well, maybe I'll just say it now. Um, uh, Samantha mentioned that you were going to come back to us at some point with a, a kind of an update on the Front Street project, the hotel. I just wanted to make sure that that staff was going to include specifically information about the sale of the two city-owned plots and how that um, relates to the Surplus Land Act. It, just make sure that that was in there. I just wanted to state that publicly. Yeah, sure. No problem. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of project updates. The um, It's looking like the front riverfront project um, building, we're expecting building permits to be submitted any day now. So um, that project's moving along and, and if all goes according to plan, um, they'll probably break ground um, in the spring of next year is, is what I'm thinking. Um, the uh, the 831 water mixed use project, this is the SB35 um, application at the corner of water and North Branch of 40. That was heard by city council uh, last week at their uh, October. Um, and they took action to uh, deny uh, the, uh, the application for failure to meet certain objective uh, development standards. And, and in their decision, they cited um, the project's inconsistency with uh, City ordinance that requires the affordable units to be um, integrated with the market rate units. Um, they also uh, had uh, concern with proximity to a 30% slope of completed stormwater and drainage plans, a noise study, um, and a traffic study. So um, the applicants are currently in the process of um, determining their next steps, and and um, we'll see where that goes. Um, We'll be um, updating the web page for that project as information becomes available. So if you're interested in that project, make sure um, you sign up uh, to be notified anytime we add uh, information to that web page. Um, as far as the upcoming schedule goes, um, we uh, at our next meeting, um, as Matt mentioned, we have an objective standards check-in um, with you uh, as well as a a West Cliff Drive walkway repair uh, project. Um, and then on November 18th, got an appeal of uh, staff approval of a minor modification to a coastal permit for a project on uh, at 109 Seabright Avenue, um, as well as the, the, um, the FDU ordinance. Um, and so, uh, and then on December 2nd, we've got um, some public access improvements uh, in and around Antonelli Pond that are on that agenda. So we've got, um, looks like, items for the next three agendas. Um, Commissioner Greenberg. So, thanks so much. I'm sorry if I missed it, but when was uh, the discussion of the um, surplus land and the Front Street Hotel going to be on the agenda? Uh, you had requested that we uh, provide that to you for your next meeting. Good afternoon. Okay, got it. Thank or just be a status report. Yeah. Is it possible? Okay, that's just a status report. So we wouldn't have like a procedural motion associated with that, or? Uh, no, there is there is no action for you to take um, right. on that per se. Mm -hmm. um, we we you know we're happy to provide you with um, you know information on on what we know so far about that and the process moving forward. It would be helpful to know what our role is because I think there's a lot of confusion. Yeah, and so I think having a report on that would be very helpful. Certainly, and we did review the uh, correspondence that came in from um, the the attorney for that organization, um, and, and did some um, uh, legislative uh, review, and, and we can include our our conclusions um, on that, and and what role you may or may not have in this matter. Great. Um, Thanks. Do you have anything else? No. Well, I have a few. Um, as you know, we are meeting virtually. Um, and other agencies, there's a new law that allows us to meet virtually. I have two questions that I, I, I think the commission consider or we should hear from staff about. 
One, does the commission get to make its own decision about how it wants to hold meetings? Because one of what the county is doing, what the other agencies are doing, are having hybrid meetings uh, where you know people can come or people can come virtually. And I think you know there's a lot to be. Uh, I know, at least I understand that the city uh, council chambers may not be set up for that, but maybe moving in that direction. I would like to get a report on, um, you know, what the, what the status of virtual meetings are and what the commission's authority is to uh, determine the, the way, the kind of meetings it wants to hold. Is that okay? So yeah, I, I believe that's um, something that's going to be considered um, by the council at an upcoming meeting. Um, I don't know the specifics, so I can certainly look into that for you. Can we get a report on that? Maybe, you know, it's in there. just a, it's no big deal. Just even if it's just an oral report. Sure. Um, so let us know how things stand on that and what our role is, because it isn't really clear whether we have an independent role or whether we just do whatever the council does. And then, some questions on some projects. Could you update me on what's happening with the various downtown affordable housing projects? Uh, I'm aware of three projects that, or actually potentially four, and I'm just wondering uh, where they are in the process. Yes, and I have Sam, Sam still on the line, and she's pretty close to some of I think between the two of us, we can answer that. Um, the one that comes to mind is Pac South first. Um, Pacific South is the one that's just uh, is that north of the Pacific Front Laurel project. So there's another one. Um, Pac South, um, I believe, is working through some issues on sanitation measures. They have some soil contamination um, issues from previous uses at the site, and so they're having to um, you know make sure they do some mitigations like install a vapor barrier. Um, so I believe that they are working through that and also working on putting together building plans. Um, so they have a, there's an applicant and there's a project and it's, you know, it's getting to try to figure out the construction, right? So it, does it have its financing? Oh, that I don't know um, if they have their financing or not. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from housing here, they would be closer to that. Um, I know that Jim Renler for the future housing is the applicant but um, let me see if they've actually building plans yet. Um, I believe they have. Okay, well, that's exciting. That's enough. And then what about uh, Pacific Station, whatever that's called, so? Um, Pacific Front Laurel is the one that's under construction currently. That's the one at the corner of Pacific Front and Laurel on the corner there. Um, Interestingly, also had the soil contamination issues, so they're um, working through those as well, but they are under construction. Now that's the 100 Walt Laurel Street? Yes. I had heard, and that's why I wanted to raise this, that there was water table problems and that the project was gonna have two levels of underground parking, but it can't, it can only have one, and. What's going on with that? Is that a problem or is it just really the soil contamination that's the problem? Um, I haven't, I'm not aware of those issues. I haven't heard of that, but a, a I can- constituent brought it to my attention and I sort of indicated that I'd ask staff to look into it. So maybe if you could check with the building department, um, I would think if they can't have the two stories of underground parking that they'd need a, mod a modification to their purpose. Yes. So, you know, we should, um, if that's the case, please let us know. Okay, will do. And then the Metro Center project is housing project. The, um, the, the other affordable housing project is called Pacific North. Yeah. Just to make it easy. And yeah. <laughs> Um, they have not submitted their building permit plans yet, but they um, have received their entitlement. And so there's a nonprofit that's doing that project or? Yes, that nonprofit is, Eric, do you remember? Uh, <laughs> um, it's okay. Um, then the, there's a development on Ocean Street that 
never seems to reach completion. Um, and I went to the sort of early opening during Affordable Housing Month, and it's a very impressive project. Um, I'm looking forward to the opening, and I really encourage uh, the whole commission to go because it really shows what an affordable housing project can be like. And it's in a very difficult location in terms of traffic, but they've done, I think they've done a great job. But they never seem to finish the sidewalk. And I, do you know what's going on with them? Yeah, I think you're referring to 350 Ocean, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, they are working on finishing up their construction. They have a few things left. I did go out and do a final inspection already. I know they're wanting to get their occupancy soon, but they do have some um, some outlying issues with an easement on their property. And um, um, so we're trying to work through those issues and we're hoping that they will be able to resolve that issue before um, before we final the project. Um, I know they were hoping to occupy in July, so it's, <laughs> it's problematic that it's taking so long, it's causing them a fortune. So that's unfortunate because that's a, uh, It'll be really, that'll be a really good project once it opens. Um, yeah, we have um, suggested that we amend their affordable housing agreement to provide some parameters on them finishing up that easement issue. And we're currently working with their attorneys on, on that. Okay, well, good luck. Um, I think it would be helpful for the commission, given what's going on with the UCSC Long Range Development Plan to get a report at a future commission meeting on of the university's plan. And, you know, there are negotiations going on between the city and the county and the university. I just think the commission should, the, the, the plan that the university, you know, the long development plan will have a massive impact on the city, depending on how it's carried out. And I think it would be helpful for the commission to get a report on what's going on. because. It, it hasn't really been to the commission before. Is there any problem with it? Yeah, I, I, we'll uh, we'll look at when we can schedule that. Definitely, okay, and great. It would be best to give that report. And I think you know uh, the applicant on the hundred uh, the board of the consensus fee project talked about renin numbers and uh, the uh, scary future in terms of. Um, more more requirements than can possibly be met. Um, can we? Uh, uh, what's your intention of giving the commission a report on what's going on with the status of uh, the next housing element and the median numbers and uh, the background on that? Matt, did you want to respond to that? Lose I, I saw a speaker come on. There he is. Okay, sorry, I missed the last part. What was that? Yes, um, whether it made sense or when it made sense of the commission to get a report on the status of the next housing element and the arena numbers and where they are this and how, you know, what's really going on. There's a lot of discussion, but um, none of it's official, and I get nervous about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for bringing that up as well. We intended to have ARENA update along with the legislation update to City Council. So we have been working with AMBAG this past year on the ARENA methodology. And uh, we'll be presenting both the ARENA methodology with AMBAG most likely at the meeting as well, Council, and then go into how that informs our uh, housing element process over the next several years. Okay, great. So that, that'll likely also take place in the new year. And that'll that'll coincide with when we will likely be getting our uh, our final draft of the arena numbers, which are, are currently still in draft form at the moment. Okay, thank you. So we will be getting that at some point. Yep. The last thing I have is to alert uh, staff and the commission that I'm going to be putting an item on maybe for the next agenda that would be a recommendation that the commission recommends to the council that they initiate a process for establishing a commercial affordable housing linkage fee. 
um, where um, the county has this, the city of Watsonville has it. Um, we make demands of housing developers to provide housing, uh, affordable housing. But at this point, commercial developers uh, who oftentimes create jobs for um, lower income residents uh, have no responsibility to help with the affordable housing uh, crisis that we're in. And having a, a linkage fee that uh, relates to, uh, you know, that requires a, a contribution from commercial developments of a certain scale to uh, support affordable housing in the community, I think is worth pursuing. So my intention is to, uh, I know Julie knows about, uh, Commissioner Conway knows about county and um, the county side for a number of years. And I'm going to, my intention is to put a letter on the next agenda to, rec to recommend that we make a recommend to the recommendation to the council that they initiate the process to establish such a fee. So I just wanted to get that out in public so I can try to avoid also any kind of Brown Act issues being this forward. But um, I, I wanted to alert you that, that I'm intending to do that. I don't have any, uh, I'm, I appreciate the commission giving me the time to go through all it. We haven't met for so long. There just hasn't been an ability to ask questions about all the stuff that's going on. A lot's been going on. It just hasn't involved us. So I appreciate the updates on these various items. Do any other commissioners have information items that they want to bring? Okay, we're now to committee and advisory body oral reports. And so I don't think we have any advisory bodies left. Uh, I don't think there's anything there. Is there any reason that we shouldn't adjourn? Okay, then we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Nice. Nice. Good to see everyone. And nice to see y'all. Take care.